We want to welcome everyone to the Southern Rack tonight. Uh, appreciate those that are attending online and in person. It's a uh, I never would have guessed that having an on or an in-person rack would feel different after being online for so long. It's a little intimidating still, but uh, we'll muddle through tonight, right? So I uh, appreciate everyone coming, appreciate your time, appreciate those that are online. And uh, we've had a lot of comments tonight, so we'll try to be thorough in tonight's rack, um, but also move it along with all the input we've had. Uh, just a couple things before we get started. Comment cards are in back. Agendas are in back. If you have a comment, uh, please fill out a card and turn it in so that we can have you come up. Uh, we would just encourage those that are here to comment. Um, there's no reason to come and, and watch the proceedings. We assume you're here to talk, so please do. Uh, that's why we have these public meetings. So I want to welcome the RAC members. And I guess we'll start with introductions of the RAC. Let's start over here, Chuck, if you want to just introduce and who you represent and where you're from. Yeah, my name is Chuck Chamberlain. I represent the Forest Service, and I'm from here in Cedar City. I'm Dan Fletcher, representing Bureau of Land Management. I live here in Cedar City. Gene Boardman, representing the public at large, and I'm from Hinkley, Utah. I'm Bart Batista, non-consumptive representative from Kanab, Utah. Nick Jorgensen, non-consumptive representative from St. George, Utah. And I'm Braden Richmond. I represent Sportsman, currently the chair of the Southern Act from Beaver, Utah. Bradley Roberts, also representing Sportsman from Tropic. Craig Lobb from Burrell, Utah, representing Agriculture. Tammy Pearson, Myersville, Utah, Beaver County, formerly Hinkley. <laughs> Elected official, right? I'm Austin Atkinson from Cedar City, representing public at large. Verlin King from Bicknell, Utah, representing livestock. Okay, thank you. We also want to welcome and acknowledge all the members of the... Oh, sorry, thanks. Chad's, this new format is going to take me a little bit to get used to. We have RAC members attending online, so I'll have to be, probably be reminded every time to include them in the vote. So, uh, Chad, do you want to pipe up and introduce yourself? Sure. Chad Utley, represent public at large from St. George, Utah. Thanks, Chad. Try not to forget about you. Um, as I said, we want to welcome the members of the division here and those that will be presenting, those that are here uh, to help out. I would go through names and positions, but I'll surely mess them up and forget someone or what they do or a name. So I'll let you introduce yourselves as you come with your presentations and as, you, as we have questions for you, if that's okay. Um, just to go over the RAC procedure quickly to remind everybody, we will... We no longer have the presentations from the RAC. Those, uh, we should have all watched those. At, I'm getting an echo. We should have all watched those online. Uh, we encourage the public to watch those online so we don't have the presentations anymore. We will have time for questions and comments. Um, so as we go down the agenda, we'll take questions from the RAC, then questions from the public, and then comments from the public and comments from the RAC, and then we'll discuss and make motions. So I uh, will follow that procedure. Again, we'd encourage those that are here, please talk. Uh, we want to hear your input. We want to hear your thoughts. So if you're here, we would hope that you're not here to watch, but you're here to participate. I think that's all I need to go over for the procedure. Anything else you would add? Okay, let's go to item number two there. I would take a motion on accepting the minutes, approving of the agenda and accepting the minutes if anyone wants to make a motion. I'll make that motion. So Tammy's made a motion to accept or approve the agenda and minutes. Do we have a second on that motion? I'll second that. We've got a second from Chuck. Any discussion? Let's vote. All in favor? Chad, are you in Aye. favor? Aye. Yes. Unanimous. Thank you. 
The next item is the wildlife board update. Let me just read through what happened at the last wildlife board quickly. Uh, quite a bit of discussion on the once in a lifetime species recommendations. There was a motion that they would reduce the season dates on Pine Valley Virgin River and Pine Valley Beaver Dam desert sheep hunts to begin after the rifle deer hunts. Ultimately that failed with a vote of three to two. There was a motion to approve the recommendations as presented and that passed unanimously. Uh, there was a motion to approve the recommendations on the fishing recommendations and that passed unanimously. The conservation permit audit, a motion to accept as presented and that passed unanimously. Sorry about that. Uh, motion to accept the conservation permit allocation and that passed unanimously. And the rack and board meeting dates and that passed unanimously. So I think that covers everything. Next on the agenda, we'll move on to the regional update and I'll turn it over to you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, Carmen, could I have the presentation pulled up, please? While well, she's finding that, we've been asked to be a little more formal in our in our rack update. So we'll be, I'll have a short presentation at the beginning of each of the racks if we can make the technology work. Which I know it was up a few minutes ago. And Mike, do we know where that's at? She's bringing it up. Okay. Okay, Carmen, if you'll just then advance those as we see them. So we'll start with our, ooh, start with the, the wildlife section. If you'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So let's pause right there for a minute. Um, that's an amazing picture to me. That was taken uh, during our, our flights on the Zion just last week. Look at that one U. She's got to be 12 feet in the air trying to get up on that cliff. Um, if I'm if I'm reading that picture right, uh, I don't know. I didn't have the, I didn't have the next the next the next picture, but they're they're amazing to watch um, out there. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So we just finished our bighorn sheep flights on the Kaparowitz and the, the Kaparowitz West and the Zion units. Um, we don't have I don't know that we've got the data compiled there yet, but that that data will be available when. We're ready to make recommendations. Um, the picture you have here, this is a bear that was in a tree in downtown Richfield or somewhere in Richfield yesterday. It caused a bit of a stir. We were able to successfully um, dart and, and move her. Um, but we, there was, what, what, Levi, a couple hundred people, 150 people there gathered around and, and Levi, we darted her and he went up and climbed the tree and put a rope around it and lowered it down and it was, he was kind of a hero yesterday, so. Um, deer captures will be conducted the first part of December. We'll be conducting deer captures on the Monroe, the Beaver, and the Pine Valley. Um, I think we're back in a scenario where we can have some people join us, which we like to do. We've been done those without any, any help the last couple of years. So, um, RAC members, before you leave here tonight, if you have an interest, please come and visit with me and I, so that I can get your names down and then We'll also be able to invite some sportsmen to come and help us there as well. Um, Teresa is in mourning right now because we have a, a deer that she's watched very closely that would go all the way from the from the buckskin down by the Arizona Strip and come clear back up by Summit. Um, she was hit on Highway 89 this last week, and um, but one a pretty amazing uh, example of of the migration initiative and the things we're learning there. Um, we're in the process of rehiring one of our Utah Prairie Dog positions to replace Adam Cavaluna. You'll find out why here in just a minute. And then we also will be doing Christmas bird counts in the next month. And if anybody has an interest in being involved with those, um, you could contact, reach out to, to Teresa and she can put you in touch with Keith Day. Um, if you really want to spend some time with somebody that really knows birds in Southern Utah, it's pretty, 
pretty interesting experience to go spend a day with Keith. Let's go on to the next slide, please, Carmen. So do our aquatic section. So uh, I put this picture up. This is a picture of the reconstruction up at Fish Lake. This is the Bowery Marina. This marina is probably four or five times bigger than it was before. Um, we've, we've, we've completed the reconstruction on the um, lakeside and the lodge marinas, all of which are now uh, will accommodate larger boats. They're deeper. We were having, I mean, the, the marinas that we had up at Fish Lake had been there since the, the 40s or the 50s. Um, within the next six months, they will all be completely rebuilt with a lot of partners um, with, with the county and, and the Forest Service and everybody else. And, and that's gonna be a, a huge issue and a, a good thing for, uh, for our fishermen up on, on Fish Lake. Next slide, please. So I just mentioned the Fish Lake Marinas, um, $1.7 million project. It's about 65% complete and we're, we're more than doubling the size of all those marinas. We completed a treatment up at Navajo um, last month to reset the fish populations in that lake uh, where we feel like we got a good treatment. We will be putting together a group to, to rewrite a management plan for that water here shortly um, to determine what, uh, what fish species to put back in there. We'll probably go with a little bit different mix if, um, to see if we can find uh, predators that will keep the chub population down. There's no way to remove them out of, completely out of the system. The chubs will come back. Um, and they're a great forage fish if we've got the right, the right fish in there to take advantage of them. Um, this picture is of our camp out on Lake Powell, um, up the San Juan Arm. You can see how low Lake Powell is. If you haven't been down there this year, it's, it's a different place than it normally is. And we really need um, good snowpack on the west slope of Colorado and in, in southern Wyoming is really the, the, where, what feeds Lake Powell. And I'm hoping for it to be really deep this year so that we can get water back in Lake Powell. Um, our, our nets were a little bit lighter than we expected, um, but with the, the water conditions, um, it's not unexpected, um, but they were a little lighter than normal. But the, the fishing right now in Lake Powell is really good. Uh, we stocked fish in Redmond and Jackson Flat Reservoirs with a species with white crappie. Um, southern region is the only place in Utah where you can find that species of fish. So in addition to those two lakes, you can also find them in Gunnison Bend and um, DMAD Reservoirs near Delta. And then we had a, a victory with our um, efforts to try to keep species from being listed under the Endangered Species Act. There was a petition to list the virgin spine dace, which is one of the species that's, that's endemic to just the Virgin River. Um, down in, in the St. George area and beyond. And that was found not, not warranted due to the implementation of, an, of a cooperative agreement that we've been working on down there. So that was a good example of uh, when, when different groups come together, we can do good things and keep, keep animal or species off the endangered species list. Let's go to the next slide, please. Our habitat section. So this is a new crossing structure that's in Baker Canyon. So just there um, between I-70 and, and Fillmore, um, as you come down the canyon there with the reconstruction that's been going on there. UDOT has been a great partner with us. And this is an example of another, another crossing um, to make I-15 more permeable and, and allow animals to get out to winter range that they really haven't had access to um, for the last 30 years or more. So. Next slide, please. Um, lots of restoration projects ongoing. You can, uh, I won't go through them all in, in detail there. We're, we're working on some additional fencing at, at Bicknell Bottoms and, and a big project in up around Fillmore to uh, improve the road conditions on, on the Pioneer Road. Um, monitoring the recently completed crossings in, in Baker Canyon, as I mentioned, and we're nearing completion of a new conservation easement um, that will be specifically for condors. It's just on the edge of, of Zion. Um, we've had some, some landowners there that came forward and offered a conservation easement, and that's been a really good project as well. Next slide, please. Our outreach section, this is a picture of, a, of one of our youth pheasant hunts or actually new hunter pheasant hunts out on the Pavant um, WMA just this last Saturday. Next slide. Um, so Adam Cavalunas, who was one of our prairie dog biologists has been hired as our new outreach manager, replacing Phil Tuttle, who 
um, took a position that's that's supervised out of Salt Lake. I mentioned the youth pheasant hunts, and then also we will be continuing pheasant releases until the first weekend in December, and you can find the information on where, when and where those releases will take place online. Next slide. Our law enforcement section, this is a, a decoy project that they set up during the elk hunt um, and ended up making a couple of at least one or at least issuing at least one citation using this using this decoy that you're seeing them set up right here. Next slide. You can see that they don't set those up until it's well after dark. There's no question of if you're beyond shooting hours um, with those. Wyatt Meekham um, has been hired as a new officer in, in Garfield County. Wyatt was with us in the past and then um, went to a different agency for a little while and we're, we're happy to have him back. Um, our canine officer, Carlo, Carlo's the four-legged officer in this picture, not, not Josh, um, but he has been re medically retired. And so Josh is working at getting a, a new dog and we'll be training him. That's, that um, program has been phenomenally successful. Our dogs, we have, we have a canine in each of our five regions and they, the number of requests that we get from other agencies for search and rescue and all of the thing, uh, anything else you can think of, and they've had some huge successes, has been you know beyond what we expected. Um, just some highlights from the fall hunting season. There were several search search warrants that were um, conducted. We had the decoy uh, project, lots of investigations into big animals that have been poached. We're down about half of our officers in the in the region right now, and despite that. Um, the officers were able to respond to all the calls um, and cases been, while still getting out on a patrol. So they, they put in a lot of hours. We should have two new officers hitting um, Washington County. Is Paul here? I th think in about December and then probably two more hitting the region. So we'll be, we'll be back to close, close to full staff with about a year from now. Officers here. Oh. I'm going to have to count those in my head to let you know. We've got, I, I think it's about 12 and we're, at, we're down six. Is that just in our region or state? That's, that's just in our region. Now, that doesn't include the sergeants and the investigators and the lieutenant, um, but just the, the, the district officers, I think there's 12. If, if, if Paul gets here, he can correct me on that. But um, Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, that's, that's all I have. I'm be happy to answer any questions if there are any. <laughs> Phil had some, had some, they're asking about why you're wearing a sling, Phil. He, he had some shoulder surgery. Uh, okay. It's uh, yours, Braden. I got a question. Oh, go ahead, uh, just, uh, what, uh, what does the uh, region think the the deer are looking like at this time well our our, our deer herds are down as everybody knows um, l largely the result of of three really really bad drought years um, the rains that we got in July and August I think really helped um, we'll find out for sure when we do our captures coming up later in December and we get the weights on our on our does. That's that's the next big piece of data that's going to come in, Gene, to, to let us know if we're if we're going to start a rebound or not. If if the does aren't healthy in December, they're not going to have healthy fawns and fawn survival is going to be low. If our does come in in December, which we anticipate in good shape with with good fat reserves, that bodes well for for our fawn crop for next year. Um, but it can't be just one summer of of good rain. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to have things change um, for a couple of years to really get back to where we want to be. Um, but there's no doubt that our fawn survival is low again this year, um, largely because of just a lack lack of nutrition. We're we're doing everything else that we can from from predators and habitat. Uh, we just need to catch a break from Mother Nature. Teresa, anything you'd like to add to that? Okay. Any other questions from the rack? Okay, let's move into the uh, waterfowl recommendations, agenda item number five. So again, we should have all been able to watch those presentations online. 
Um, before we go to questions from the RAC, I'm gonna turn it back over to Kevin so he can review the comments. Not a lot of comments on, uh, comments on this particular agenda item. We had four people comment specifically in our region and they were split. We had um, two that somewhat agreed and two that either neither agreed nor disagreed. So really not a lot of, a lot of public comment on this one. Oh, okay. A really strong feedback to form our opinions on. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, so questions from the rack on the waterfowl recommendations. We have Blair Stringham here, our waterfowl coordinator. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't know if you heard that in the mic, but Blair's here to answer any questions that we have, the waterfowl coordinator. Go ahead, Austin. I do have a question for Blair. <laughs> As far as shooting trumpet or swans, I understand that's the problem with why we need an orientation course and all that. Is there anything that could be done with like a waiting period? Like if you did shoot a trumpeter, obviously the quota can shut the hunt down, but can that put you in a five year, 10 year wait to get another swan permit? And what is being done at the, div at the division level to discourage people from shooting those trumpeters besides an orientation course? Yes, that's a great question. So we, we we talked about all kinds of options. Some were the waiting period. Some were just not allowing people to um, keep the swans if they shoot them, the trumpeter swans. Ultimately, we decided to err on the side of education first. Um, a lot of the people that we talked with last year had who weren't aware of the swan season closing or shot trumpeter swans weren't aware that we were trying to discourage people from doing that. And so what we had required in the past was for people to take that course before they could apply. But after they'd taken it once, they didn't have to take it again. So we thought the first step would be just to require people to take it on an annual basis every time they apply. And we'll see if the education through that course will help people to not pursue trumpeters. Um, if it doesn't, then we'll likely start considering other options like waiting periods or something else like that. So, Blair, I have a question on that kind of same subject. Uh, I have heard that there are people that are targeting the trump trumpeter swans because they know there is a quota. In the trumpeter swans that were taken, do you have any idea the percentage of targeted versus uneducated? Do you have any feedback of why the whys of who's harvesting those? Uh, we don't have any data on that. Um, we did know like in the past, generally people that shot trumpeters didn't even know that they had shot a trumpeter swan until they brought it in. And that was largely because we had very, very few in the state. And so to actually go out and find a trumpeter and shoot it on purpose was almost impossible. Um, but we have seen the last couple of years a lot more trumpeters moving through the state. And so people have isolated where those swans are at. And you can, if you want, go out to some of those areas and potentially shoot one. Um, you have a lot higher chance than you did five years ago. So I would suspect that the number of people targeting has increased, but we still get quite a few people that when they bring their swans in to get checked, don't know it's a trumpeter. So there's still the accident people out there as well. Thank you. Chuck? Yeah, I had a question about the, the geese bag limits. You, you separated the white front from the, from the Canada geese this, this year. Um, so, so you can get five Canadian or Canada geese and you can get six white front. So you essentially can get 11 geese now in a day. Is that Yep. What I'm reading now? Okay, I just want to make sure. Yep. Any other questions from the RAC? Questions from the public? Okay, comments from the public. Do we have any comment cards on this agenda item? Comments from the RAC? All right, well, let's uh, move into the motions. Let's see, would anyone make a motion on this item? Braden, I'll uh, make a motion that we approve the waterfowl recommendations as presented. I'll second it. So we have a motion from Austin to accept as presented and a second from um, Nick. Any further discussion? Okay, let's vote. Uh, Tammy stepped out for just a minute, but I think we'll vote without her. All in favor? And Chad? Aye. 
Any opposed? Okay, passed unanimous. Let's move on to agenda item number six, big game application timeline. And I'll turn it over to Kevin to give us the feedback we got from the public. Well, if you've been watching or reading the comments that came in, you'll know this was the one that generated the most feedback. We had 66 people comment on this. 80% of them um, strongly disagreed with the presentation or with the recommendation. And then the other 20% are kind of evenly split between the other the other categories. But um, I think this is the one where we'll probably earn our, our keep tonight is working through this issue, so. Yeah, as Kevin said, this is probably one of the uh, more comments I've seen in quite a while in Iraq meeting. So I was, I was frankly surprised it got that much feedback, but it has, so. That's good, uh, but let's muddle through it and hopefully come up with a good decision. So let's go to questions from the rack. Got Lindy Barney here to answer questions. Yeah, thank you. Lindy's here to answer all your tough questions. Yeah, I have, I have a question about the multi-season tags. Um, so we've, we got a lot of comments about multi-season, some for and, and quite a few saying we should drop the multi-season. Um, I want to make sure I understand how those tags are given out. So um, if we had 100 multi-season tags and we put those back into the pot, um, we don't get 300 tags back because we get 100 tags spread among three hunts, right? Is that correct? We, correct, okay. yeah. The, the multi-seasons just come off the top of the overall quota. Okay, so that's not going to increase on no, our opportunity. No, it, it will okay. not. The only thing it would increase is the, the number of hunters that could have hunts. Is that right or no? I mean, no, only the multi season is allows you to go out on all three seasons, season. yeah. but it wouldn't increase us the, the permit quota. The no, it will not. Hey, Chair, <clears throat> question that would be directed at Lindy. I have a question about item number five, which is strictly informational. Yeah, we kind of jumped over that one. <laughs> Can we ask questions about that informational item? Yeah. Okay. Lindy, question. Why can we not push the draw deadline back even one more week to be beyond the board meeting in 2023? Because I need time to clean up all the data. Um, it takes time to run a draw. And so we need that time to start going through all the applications when you have almost 600,000 apps. It does take time to review it. Um, we have a machine that does it, looks at, compares apps, but it does take human eyes to review everything too. Um, those that are potential. And then um, once the, that's, we're doing that be, the week before the board meeting. And then once the board meeting happens, that's when we put all the numbers in, create everything and then run the draw and then charge credit cards. And that just, it just takes time when you have that much volume. Understood. Would it be possible to say if we push it back one more week behind the board meeting and we could just get results one week later in the first week of June? And if everyone's happy with that, go. Um, it will push back the, the answer to the straw, which then the hunts, you know, a lot of them start August 1st. So we do that. We just keep pushing everything back and people may not. So it's, it's a domino effect. Um, from my feedback that people have called me on this, they don't, May 31st is still too late for them to get the results. They want it sooner than later. Okay. Next question. Can we have the edit your application option for 2022? We are in the programming right now. It will be ready this summer, okay. um, but not for the big game. We've not this no, because there needs some rule changes that I will be bringing out this spring to make it happen, but it's in the works to go into place this summer. Okay. And last question on this item. Why do we still need the two extra weeks for people to apply for points only? Like, isn't five weeks enough? Why do we still try to preserve those two extra weeks for points only? Yeah, that's definitely something that, you know, if the public sentiment is to get rid of that, it's something the division can look at. But we've always just had seven weeks, um, and it seems like that's enough time for everyone to apply um, throughout people's life. You know, if you do a two-week application, people tend to forget. Um, but like I said, if it's this public sentiment, it's something that we can do away with, but we would prefer not to just because people do, life happens, people need that extra two weeks to apply for just points. Okay. 
Kevin, let me make a recommendation here, and you guide me if I'm wrong, but we missed that informational item on the agenda. I wonder if we want to pause just a minute and hit that informational item as, yes. as Austin brought it up, and then so we don't confuse the two. Where it's not on the agenda, Linda, can I, Lindy, sorry, can I get you to just quickly bring us up to speed on what that item is so we're all on board, and then we could ask any additional questions on that. We won't have yeah. a motion on that. We won't vote on it because it is informational, but let's hit it real quick. Yeah, no, so no was, problem. There was a presentation available. I hope, yeah. Hopefully everybody saw the presentation. So, so um, back in June, the Wildlife Board asked the division to look at pushing the big game application back so people could have proposed or some type of idea of what the quota would be when they're applying for big game species. So we worked with our wildlife section, our contractor, to push back the application um, date. So in 2023, we would open up in mid-March and close in end of April. Um, and then results would be posted by May 31st. Thanks, then, Lindy. Yeah, during that time, you would have the application, the permit numbers, um, but they're only proposed permit numbers. And I thought the presentation online did a very good job of explaining it. Again, we should have all watched that. Uh, but I didn't want to confuse that item and number five. So if there's other questions on that one, even though it's informational, let's hit that and then we can move on to agenda item five or six, the big game application timeline. So any other questions on that informational item? Go ahead. I guess I'll ask a follow up on that. <clears throat> I apologize, I've kind of lost my voice here, but this document that they provided if everybody hasn't seen it, we've asked for this for a while, but it's the summary of big game permits. And so it included a conservation section, a landowner tag section, an expo tag section, and a public draw section. So my question is, when we go to approve numbers this spring, will we be able to see it in a format similar to this as a supplement when we approve tag numbers, or will it be back to the old way? Is there someone that can answer that? I'm going to ask Kobe to come answer that since he will be the one overseeing that. All right, Austin, so I wanna make sure that I understand your question. It's, there are, there, there the, the public permits, which we recommend through the process uh, in the spring. There are also other permits, uh, conservation permits, expo permits uh, recommended on different cycles at different meetings. In the southern region, that was a concern. Uh, it was brought up last year. Mm -hmm. And when we came to some middle ground, we said we will publish this on the website so that everybody knows and, and has an accounting. I, <clears throat> I don't know that we would add those numbers to the rack packet, but we'd make sure that they were up to date. And the reason why is because it starts to confuse. It's, it's already confusing when mm -hmm. you get into big game permit numbers. And so... Presenting public permits and passing public permits, I feel very comfortable with that. When you start to add in everything else, it gets confusing. Um, but for those that are interested in that, we would make sure they're update, up to date. And for Gene, we'd make sure that they were correct and, and available. So yeah, Gene pointed out that we had some errors in those. Um, we went back in and fixed them. Thanks. Uh, yes, Kobe, uh, you did... Uh make a start on that, but uh, there's still still a ways to go with, uh, with it in the, the summary that you've uh, started to build, like uh, the general season uh, units are not, uh, are not uh, shown, they, like the beaver unit is shown uh, as uh, five tags. And that's all it shows. And the rest, rest of the units are the same. It still needs to be, still needs to go further down the line. You did get the the limited entry at Elk and Pronghorn straightened out, but uh, we, we'd like to to know it on on all uh, all units and all hunts. And, and Gene, I just uh, I guess what I would say is not all limited entry units or, and, and hunts offer those types of permits. So the late season limited entry muzzleloader doesn't have mm -hmm. um, any conservation permits in it. it. 
it may have some expo permits on a few of those though. So, um, so if, if we're missing something, absolutely yeah. we'll go back, look at it again, fix it. Well, there's a big whack out of uh, land, land owner permits that uh, we'd like like to know about. Let's just take for instance the uh, the 2019 uh, annual report. Uh, on the Mount Dutton, there was 155 buck deer taken. Uh, there was uh, 76 those taken on that unit. Now, I think that uh, people would be concerned about the, that number of does if they could see that in, uh, laid out. And I think there's, there's some other areas. Uh, we, we'd like to talk about uh, landowner permits. Maybe we won't do it right now, but it may come up again tonight. Okay, thanks, Jim. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks, Austin, for pointing that out. I would have totally missed that item, so appreciate it. Okay, back to number six. Uh, we already talked about the online results there, and we started questions there. Let's go back to questions from the rack on the big game application timeline. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I just... Uh, in your file here, you have the, the any bull, how fast they sold out. Do you know how fast the spike have for the last few days? Or past the last mm -hmm. few years? So spike this year in 2021 sold out in five days. Five days. Yep, and then in 2020, it sold out in six days. In six? Yep. Okay, I'll just shoot. And, okay. and then in 2021, you got two more hours out of 2,500 more tags. Correct, basically. correct. Okay. So, so Braden, I still feel like we're talking about two different, this is Chuck over here. <laughs> we're talking about two different agenda items here. We're talking about six and seven at the same time. And so. Th that was exactly what my side huddle going on here with okay. Kevin was. Yeah. Hold on just a second, right. but I think you're exactly right is my understanding. Yeah, so item number six, just to keep everyone on track here, we're, now we're talking about three questions on item number six, and we're going to rein this in. We're, we're done with question 5.5. That wasn't on the agenda. Now we're on agenda item six, and next will be on agenda item seven, which is the max permits and the over-the-counter elk permits. So on, a, on agenda item six is the big game application timeline. And so we want to we want to follow this one through. Thanks, Chuck. And then we'll jump to either, so, or so agenda so seven. The application timeline is one that we just is the one that we just did. Correct. So that that the, it's the, on the agenda. It's just mislabeled as an action item where it's an information. That's that's our problem on the. So we're done with six. We're done with six. We are. We, we are should have had our huddle longer with we, the mic off. Yes, we should have. <laughs> okay. And I could have helped you there. So now we're on to seven. Thank you for wrapping up that. Con okay, so we are on the correct one now. <laughs> Item number seven. <laughs> Thank you. We'll be back on track. Let's go back to an internet forum. This is really proving difficult so far. Okay, agenda item seven. Max point permits and over-the-counter elk recommendations. Hey, questions. Braden, let's, uh, can we uh, hey, Gene, do these? Don't mess me up at this point. This has been rough enough. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to help you. All right. C could we do, do the, this is two separate things. Let's talk, talk about the, uh, the draw. There's one item and talk about the point. Uh, Okay. The 60, 40 points is another item. I think when we come to recommendations, we'll definitely want to approach those separately. I think on questions, I think let's just let's just uh, go forward with all questions, but maybe in the discussion and the motions, we could separate those out would be my thought there. But in the questions, let's just hit the questions uh, and go through them. But the motions, definitely. Okay. 
All right, questions from the rack on agenda item seven. All right, Chair, I got some questions. <clears throat> I'll move this over here so I can look at you, Lindy. So I know this has been said that we need the data, and I understand that we want the data of, show us how many people will actually apply for these tags, then we'll know how many people are out there since we don't seem to know. Um, I would say anytime we're changing this many variables, uh, we've screwed up the data anyway. So my question is, how many unique license holders have bought any bull tags in the last two years? I don't have the last two years, but over the last five years, it's been about 40,000 unique um, hunters. I can get the last two years. 40,000, and that wouldn't be counting the, say, 12,000 archery hunters, mm -hmm. not including them, right? Not, not including. This is just for the, okay. any, the any bull permits. Okay. So I think, to me, that's the number we're looking for. So I would say, what other data do we need if by asking someone who is planning to elk hunt in July and making that decision in July to now apply in February, what data are we looking for? So some other things that we're looking for that, you know, with look, working with the elk committee is kind of how many people are any bull hunters and just spike bull hunters or how many people want an any bull permit and if they can't get it, can they get a spike bull? You know, we don't have those kind of answers. Um, this proposal is just not about the data though either. It's, it's bigger than that. It's the supply and demand of these permits. Um, going into the draw, it, it's a plus side because we would be able to get that data. But the, the main reason for this proposal is supply and demand. We have so much demand for these permits, we don't have enough supply. And so that's what's causing these permits to sell out in 10 hours. And each year, you know, we did, yeah, we added two extra hours in 2021, but we also added 2,500 permits. You know, if we had just the 15,000, we may have sold out in less than eight hours. So getting the data is important. And we, we always like analyzing the data um, and they will show us different things when we work with the health committee and we can answer more questions, but it's also about the supply and demand. Lindy, can I, can I add yeah. to that? that um, and I know this is controversial, but there's, there's also a fairness issue there, Austin, and just in terms of if somebody's at work and they don't have access to a computer and they don't, on, the, on, on that day, they've just missed their opportunity completely. So there, it's it's people's individual circumstances may, you know, if they're if they're selling out in one day, you may not even have had a chance, um, you know what I mean? So there's so there's a there's a fairness question here to just make sure that everybody that has a that that wants a chance has a chance, um, rather than than, you know, I'm I happen to have a job where I can sit on my online and watch for all day, and the other guy doesn't, so. I win and he doesn't. You know, I, I think there's there is some aspect of that to this. Thank you, Kevin. Lindy, can you tell us how many surveys are sent out to general season any bull hunters, and how many surveys are returned? Do we even know how many people hunt? Um, I'm actually going to have to turn this over to Covey. They're the ones that do the surveys on this kind of information. So. Kova, you need to come sit closer to the mic, buddy. <laughs> he should know better, right? <laughs> yeah, let's ask Kent. I have Kent looking up data oh. for us tonight. So we have Kent online looking up data for us tonight. So Austin, again, you want to know the percent of any bull hunters that actually go out and hunt. Yeah, Kent, can you grab those for us? And yeah, how I small of a sample size we're looking at? I can chime in. Can y'all hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So just looking at the any bull hunters, the any weapon portion, we had 7,912 7, licenses. We sample 2016. So we aim for roughly a quarter of all their general season hunts. Of that, 90.4% went afield. Lindy, can you tell us where the $10 application fee goes? I know you brought that up in yeah. another rack, and I think it was beneficial. Yeah, so $2.50 roughly. It, it can be off by a penny or two throughout the, the years, but it's around two fifty dollars goes towards our contractor. That's what it costs to run a business with them. And then the seven fifty dollars comes back to the division. 
Um, we use that $7.50 for various things as um, salary, protecting wildlife projects, and also goes towards paying the, the credit card fees. Um, we don't put that onto the, to the hunter when they apply or purchase a permit. We pay those credit card fees um, for you guys. And so some of that money goes towards that as well. Uh, this is Verlin. So is this $10 on top of having to buy your, your small game license or whatever? I mean, yeah. we used to put in for a cow tag and pay $10. And now if you put in for a cow tag, you got to buy a combination license or something like that. So is this on top of that? It is, yes. It would just be a $10 application fee. Like if you're applying for general season deer, you got to have your hunting or combination license in order to be eligible to apply. And then you still have to pay the permit fee. Another question, what would be wrong with opening up some more any bull units and making more opportunity that way? I'm going to turn that over to the biologist. <laughs> Vernon, I thought we beat that line? up a whole bunch this spring. You I'm, wanted to resurface those I, old wounds. Vernon, where were you last year? <laughs> so, so last year uh, we had a mid plan review with the elk committee, and out of that mid plan review, um, the division came back and made a couple recommendations. One of the recommendations was to add four new general season annual units because we saw this demand and this people want to hunt. You know, hunters want an opportunity to get out and hunt and a chance at harvesting a bull. And so uh, working with the committee, the committee made that recommendation through the, through the public process. And there was there was pushback, controversy. There always is. And, you know, it, it, it seems like whoever, who, whatever group feels like they're going to have the loss at the time will show up and oppose the recommendation. And there was some opposition to that. And unfortunately, it didn't make it through the public process. So, great idea, Verlin. <laughs> All right, here's another one. The committee agreed with your idea, Verlin, but we voted it down. <laughs> Before we get off that topic, if I remember right, and you guys can correct me, <clears throat> our recommendation from the southern region was to add an any bull unit on the southwest desert. Now, is anybody going to have a different memory it, than it, you if i remember correctly the southern region actually voted to pass the all four additional units we did but specifically in our own region but when it went to the wildlife board they changed it yeah and the southwest desert was one of the ones that was proposed through the committee um i i think this rack was largely in support of the proposal but we're only one of five plus the wildlife board and it and through that process it didn't make it through there were, there were additional hams hunts added was the compromise position that that took, that happened yeah just the north it's just the the portion of the southwest desert north of of the highway it was in new units yeah and, and just to be fair you know i i think in some of the other regions we've i i've i've seen this turn into a little bit of a discussion and maybe frustration with the board, and I, I don't know that that's fair. So I just want to make sure that as a rack, we we don't go there. The, the board they have their own pressures, their own, and uh, I think it was John Bear who said it's a really easy decision until it's your decision, and I think we can all feel that, right? It, so if 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 the rack feels this and wants that, that's that's one thing. But to, to I just want to make sure we don't get into the placing blame. Kobe, I just want to say I think that's a really good comment and. This subject, watching the other, well, I watched one of the racks, heard some things from the northern rack, but I think we do want to be careful to understand the role here. The role is to sort through the comments, to sort through the recommendation, why the recommendation was made, make the best decision we can, but ours is a recommendation. The board is the one that passes the rules, so thank you, Cody. That's a good comment. I have another question. Uh, there's a couple of comments about all the hunting in states around us. How different is our program or draw or whatever it is? I don't hunt out of state and I don't hunt too much in state anymore. Austin, would you like to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say the same thing. 
<laughs> I'm saying each state is different. Each state has their own programs, their own draw system, their own unlimited tags. Um, so it can get really deep real quick. Um, but each state is unique. Um, you're saying Colorado has unlimited for bull, for bull, elk. For bull elk, Idaho. Not anymore. Oh, that's right. For non-residents, not. Austin, you're kind of a subject expert. I mean, yeah. you want to just give a quick summary of, of what? Yeah, we and I'll address some of that in my comments for sure. If that helps, yeah. I'll ask you another question, Lindy. It's been brought up in other uh, racks. Some of us have said, "Hey, just keep it over the counter, but fix your computer system, right?" And and I think it's important to understand. Uh, we use utah.gov services. So this is a state service, right? You call it the Department of Tech Services or Technology something? Service. Technology or Service. DTS. All of government agencies use them. It's a contract through them. So uh, my question is, are they a partner or a contractor? Because you mentioned another rack that we have to fork out a hundred grand to fix their system. But in my world of contractors, they fix their system and increase their price to me. So... It, it's, that, it, yeah, I, I get what you're confusing. So the, to fix the, we're fixing the database and we own the database. Um, that's one of the, the weak links that we've noticed is, is part of the database that um, DTS and us partner with. Um, the contractor is the interface that runs um, .gov type um, systems. So it's, it's kind of a mixture of both of us. So the hundred grand is to help upgrade the database to make it um, the, Increase the capacity is what we're doing. So then when someone does hit our website, when we're checking the demographics, um, all that will run a lot quicker, okay. um, that type of thing. And do we have any complaints from licensed vendors as far as sales last year, or is it strictly from online users? It's it's from online users. Are, and they're the same, it's the same contractors, the same system. It's the volume, it's the pressure that our website's hitting because we have... 40, 50, 60,000 people hitting our website. But when I say people, it's actually IP addresses. Um, and that's with any system, you know, but even if we had the, the best system possible, um, we spent millions and millions and millions of dollars to, to get the best, it still goes back to the supply and demand. We would sell out, you know, in a, in a few hours versus 10 hours. And then it goes back to what Kevin said, the fairness. Um, but so, you know, our system, sells 500,000 licenses a year. And even on our big same, big sales day for any bull, we still sold like 35,000 licenses that day. So our system works, it just takes a little bit longer because of other um, components. Lindy, can I ask a follow-up question? And mm -hmm. you just answered it, but I, I wanna ask the question anyways to kind of restate it. A lot of the discussion has been, well, if they would fix the system, right? That they, whoever that refers to, if they would fix the system, we wouldn't have this issue. But the reality is if you could log on and instantly buy the permit, the timeline of selling them out would increase drastically. And so what we talked about earlier, part of the problem is the fairness that Kevin alluded to. Um, we would actually decrease that window that you could be online to buy your permit. Is that accurate? Correct, yes. We see, yeah, it would, we'd sell out a lot quicker. I have a question, Lindy Riley. You talk about supply and demand. Aren't we actually talking about two different supply and demands? Um, one, it's the supply and demand at that specific morning that these are going on sale. Aren't we in turn creating, potentially creating with, with allowing this longer time a more a, a higher demand for the tag itself? It, it might, like, so what I hear saying, like, if we put into the draw, we may create more people wanting this permit. C correct. Okay. Correct. Right I just now, want to make sure I understood. Yeah. Good. When, you're, when you're speaking of supply, it's, this is more of clarification for me. When you're speaking of supply and demand, you're, you're talking supply and demand in that, those six hours, mm -hmm. correct? correct? Not necessarily for the tag itself. You're, you're, well, they, they want the tag, and so it sells it. Correct, but the supply and demand is just in that in that time frame uh -huh. because it's overloading the system. But potentially we're increasing the demand. That it, it's a potential, yeah. Correct. It's, it's possible if we apply put into the draw, you may have people apply for it just because it's in the draw. That is definitely a possibility. So, so Riley, I guess I would rephrase that and say, 
we're finding out what the actual demand is. We we'll find out how, who's available to try to do it on the, in the six or eight hours right now, but we don't know how many are out there that that because of you know job circumstances or other are have an interest but haven't had a chance to to play to play the game, right? Well, you know how many people bought tags. Oh, it's already on this right. <laughs> Um, you, you know how many people bought tags, but you don't know how many got dropped off the other end that were waiting in line or trying to get yeah. on. So where you do it like this, where it's an application, then you would know. So, Lindy, while we're on this uh -huh. subject with questions, still not comments, uh, could you address in at least the central rack? I don't I believe they have this discussion. The northern rack is if we're trying to figure out how many people really want these tags, there was at least a discussion, I think a motion passed in Central of going to unlimited versus putting them in a draw. Because a draw does perhaps create some artificial demand that wouldn't be there if they were unlimited. Uh, what's the drawback to, because again, this is a one year trial. Uh -huh. Next year is the Elk Committee, as I understand it. Correct. And so this really is a one year window where we're trying to figure this out. And then the Elk Committee gets the really good task of uh, making us all happy. What is the drawback to going with the unlimited instead of making them a draw? I'm going to let Kobe answer this one because he knows more about the elk pond. Um, but yeah, by part of it, it would give us a, an accurate number just as well as the draw. But there's some other aspects to it. Yeah, so I, I think I hear what the rack is saying about putting it into the draw because anytime anything's in a draw, it's better, right? And when it's better, there's the possibility that more people will apply. Um, and will give us some, the data could be a little skewed there as well. Uh, you know, Austin mentioned that you change a lot of variables and it's hard to get your, your thumb on the number. Uh, that idea of going unlimited, uh, which came before the rack again last year, um, was proposed and the sentiment at the time, there was a lot of concern that that that's not what we want to do as a state. Now, biologically, we didn't have concerns, and that's because of the topography of where these units are, the land ownership of where the any bull units are. It, it wouldn't have had a negative biological impact because we're talking about males, right? We're harvesting males. Um, the, the, there was still concern, crowding issues and whatever else on the landscape and that recommendation get, didn't get passed. Now, elk permit numbers are one of the numbers that is set in the management plan. A general season, any bull and spike bull permit numbers are set in the elk plan. Um, the, the central region and, and the north, not that we wanna get into you know how exactly all of their acts work, but they both felt like it was important to um, voice that they would rather have that than have it go into a draw. And so that was that was the sentiment there. Braden, does that answer the question? I think it was a good answer, but the question is, what's the drawback? I, I don't know that there is one. The drawbacks would be what, as I mentioned before, uh, crowding. You know, so, the, the, so the division and, and, doesn't have the division isn't opposed to that idea. It would be a social issue, but biologically, it's fine. Biologically, I don't have concerns. Socially, I have some concerns. And as I mentioned before, you know, the, the division doesn't make recommendations that are outside of a plan. We work really hard to make sure that our recommendations are in accordance with the plans that we've all agreed to. And since those numbers are set, that this is, it's not gonna be a division recommendation this round. Thank you. But Chloe, just to clarify what Braid's asking, if the elk committee came back, they recommended going unlimited. It was in the plan as a as an option. We would have no issue with it. No, we would not have an, an issue with it. And and there are other states that do this. As we as we mentioned before, Colorado does this for both residents and non-residents, um, and Wyoming does this for residents. Right. So it, it it it's not something that is crazy or unprecedented. Right. So our our opposition at this point is process oriented. That we want to we have a plan. We're going to manage to the plan. If the plan changed, our opposition would go away. That's correct. Go ahead, Bart. Who are the losers here? Nobody's really talked about that. <laughs> no, we're moving it from over the counter to draw. 
right? So there, who the, neg who's, I mean, understand biologically it's fine, right, for the species, but for the people, who's going to be hurt by it? Well, there's always people hurt when they are unsuccessful in a draw because they couldn't draw. But there's also those people not getting it when they buy it over the, the counter as well. Um, so when you have a set quota, someone's not going to obtain a permit that wanted one. Does that answer your question? That kind of in an abstract way. <laughs> <laughs> an abstract answer for an abstract question. Well, I mean, I I, I, let me just finish. I mean, it sounds great and all that, and I, I'm not a hunter, just obviously non-consumptive rep. But, you know, the, we've had a program, people use it, there must, people must like it. And there seemed to be some consternation with change to this. And so I, do, I don't think it's just a bunch of keyboard warriors who are, you know, buying it over the counter, right? So are we truly addressing, is it fair? I mean, I understand this idea of fairness and a draw and all that, but I don't know, just, just changing it because our computer system doesn't work <laughs> doesn't seem to be an answer to me. But we're not just changing it real quick. I'll let you answer in a second, Kevin. We're not just changing it because of the system doesn't work. It's because it, there's so much demand for these permits that we're selling out, and it becomes an, essentially an over-the-counter draw. Whoever can get in the line the first will get the permit. And so the demand's demand a different way. I mean, it's really the supply is the same. Demand is they're all taken up, right? So demand is met. So there's really no change. So, so Bart, I think another part of the, the loss that's here is, and, and I'll use myself as an example, is that that some people are having a hard time with the $10 application fee. That's true. Um, if I'm applying for myself and my two sons, that's an extra $30 that, that right now, if I happen to, to be able to get online and buy those, I can buy those three permits, and it's cost me $30 less than if I applied for those three permits and I drew all three of them. That's part of that's part of the opposition mm -hmm. that we're hearing is that ten ten dollar application mm -hmm. fee that comes with, with a and a draw. That's a number that that that's a cost that's set in in through the, by the legislature, and so we're in a tough spot. It's not one that we can can reduce or take away, because it's part of our fee schedule which we have to follow, and we can only be adjusted by the legislature. So there's there's some lack of flexibility there, which which I think is part of this whole. Um, argument as well. Yes. Lindy, that, would you agree with that? I would, yeah. I hear a lot of people about the $10 out fee. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to add to your mind. On the uh, <laughs> 40 or 40 60 uh -huh. uh, thing, uh, how will this change point creep? So I've been given the initiative to try to help reduce um, point creep. As we all know, it's never going away. We definitely have more applicants wanting our, to hunt in Utah than we do permits. So we're always going to have the only way to get rid of point creep is to issue a permit to every single one of them and get them out of the draw. Um, so I've been given the initiative from the Wildlife Board and, and through the Director's Office to look for ways to help get people a permit through the draw system. And this is what it is, is trying to take some of those max point holders out of the pool a little bit sooner. So then someone, we can lower that max point level just by a year or two. Um, you know, a lot of these, the 60-40 won't take effect on hunts that are less than 10 permits. Um, the 60-40 doesn't really kick in until you have 10 permits. And that's when we'll do the six permits to the max point applicant and four permits to the regular round. Because currently we're kind of already doing that if you have less than um, 10 permits. So right now, if you have three permits that are for a certain unit, two of those permits go to the max point category and one permit goes to the regular round. Um, it's only the even numbers that gets the 50-50. Um, so that, that's kind of how it is. It's, it's just a little pinhole in the bucket um, because really that's only what we can do unless we dramatically change everything that we do. Um, and that's a, a bigger discussion. Okay, that, that leads to my second question. Uh, can, you, can you tell us uh, what your thoughts are on, uh, on this whole point program? Let's say, uh, for instance, 
and on Pine Valley, uh, it's uh, four years to draw after you've drawn once right now. As uh, more people apply, that four years is going to stretch to what? Uh, on Thousand Lake, it's six years. Uh, if you uh, drew this year and you started accumulating points to draw again, when would you draw again? Probably not six years, maybe eight. Uh, just give it, give us, is this thing going to finally uh, implode or uh, come apart or? Uh, Okay. Over the years, where is it going? Okay, so just to clarify, um, the 60-40 only applies to bonus points, um, which is for our limited entry and once lifetime species. What Gene is talking about is the preference points um, when it takes to drought for a general season dare permit. Um, it's hard to say if, you know, if it's going to go up to eight, eight, 10 years. It all depends on permit numbers, how many applicants we have. All that goes into it. I. Me personally, I like the, the point system, how we do um, preference points. You know, you wait your turn, you've been applying for four years, you draw out um, versus someone that's not been applying for, you know, zero years and they draw out. So it doesn't have the 50-50. The um, we give preference to the person that's been applying the longest for these general season dare permits. But it's, it's, it's a tough question, Gene, to, to answer if it's gonna get worse or not. It all depends on applicants and permit numbers. I have a follow-up question on, on that. Uh, in, in your words, if it's just a drop in the bucket and looking at the past few years with the number of applicants and the increase in those applicants, aren't we going to have to do something more drastic anyway? We may. Like I said, we're always exploring different ideas. Um, we are looking at all different ideas, and this is the one that's you know came up that still follows what we like our our draw structure versus doing the the fifty fifty goes to the sixty forty, um, just as another little pinhole. But we are having bigger discussions, seeing what we you know what we need to do, or if we need to leave it the same, or if we need to explore different options. And looking at the numbers based on twenty twenty one, what would be the total number of max? point holders? That's a question I cannot answer because every unit's different. Well, what I'm saying and is so, what would be what would be the, the number that we're looking at, the 60, 40, how many additional max point holders oh, oh, okay. total will be punched through the system it with was the about, 60, 40 yeah, it was about split? 480 if we would have done it in 2021. That would have got drawn out. I Thank thought you were asking like total how many applicants. No, and I was no, like, I, no, I, under, I understand. Okay. No, I understand. It just depends because people swap units every year. I yeah. understand that. No, I wanted to know how, how many were, it, it, were pushing it, it, through, and because uh, in my mind, I'm I'm trying to process how fast is point creep increasing versus the drop in the bucket with the mm -hmm. sixty forty split. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Yep. So, so Lindy, I'm I'm thinking that. You take that 480 out and you kind of dull the pyramid mm -hmm. and you keep doing that every year until you've got a flat line where you have three or 400 guys who are max point holders for every draw. And then, then what do we do? Max point holders can't draw anymore because they're all max point holders. You know, that, it's, so it seems like that this is just kind of a short term solution. It doesn't, it doesn't get you more than a few years down the road, it looks like. Sorry, that's not a question, is no. it? You're good. <laughs> Lindy, we all received an email uh, with another question I want to ask you, talking about the 50% that are in the random draw, uh -huh. uh, and you do get the bonus points in that random draw, or the doing that uh, similar to how, well, it's doing it exponentially. So if you have 20 points, but you're in the random draw, those 20 points would be squared. And what that looks like as far as getting rid of that top point holder pool. Have you looked at that and what are your thoughts on that? So we d have definitely talked about that. So if we do kind of like similar to Nevada where they, they square plus one. So for your current application. So if you had 20 bonus points, if we squared it plus one, you would have 401 
app, um, draw numbers to go through the app. Um, it definitely would make a bigger dent um, in it, but it also um, kind of takes away our whole, what the draw system. Um, it would, if that's the purpose we want to do, then yeah, it's going to make a big difference if we do the, the squared plus one. But throughout this whole rack process and the many, many phone calls and emails that I've received, is they don't like taking away those those permits from the the chance of drawing those permits for the youth or beginner hunters or applicants that are going to a new species because they drew something else. So if we went to that method, I think it, we'd be giving a lot more permits to our high point holders versus our low point holders. So that's why we didn't go that route because it was a, a big number. I don't have the exact number. No, you, you answered it, thank you. I'll have more sorry. comments there okay. in a minute. I'll forego those during the question section. Go ahead. Austin. I got a question. <clears throat> so I know we're trying to make a dent in point creep. Why do we not issue, and you may have to provide some context here, but these guys that have high points, they draw a tag, they decide I don't wanna use it this year. For whatever reason, they turn it back. I know we fixed that surrender period a little bit last year, but they can still turn it back and have their points reinstated. When we get that permit back, we don't even issue it to the next max point guy who would have drawn. We just give it randomly to whoever we decide or mm -hmm. however you decide it goes to. But if we're going to address point creep, why do we not do something like that and start giving those tags back to the guys that have the points? Yep. So when we get a permit surrendered into us, we use the alternate list to issue those permits back out. Um, when we do the max point round, it's a whole new, it's a different complete list of hunters with just max points. But even if I have zero points, I'm still in that random draw for max points, just because you don't know how far you can go down the list. Um, so then when everyone, when that part is done, we go to the, re the regular draw and that's where we generate the another alternate list. Most of the time in, in my many years of doing this, those top point holders are on that list uh, on top when we call. And the reason why we haven't gone that direction is because most of these max point holders decline that permit. Um, they don't want it because they have a potential chance of drawing out in the next year or two. And they don't want the, the hunt ruined. They want the whole experience where they can go scout for a couple of months. They want the excitement of drawing out. Um, you know, we may be able to get one or two, but I don't, I believe most of them would decline that opportunity because we don't get in enough time for them to experience the full experience of that permit. Additional questions? Well, I'm excited for the discussion. I, I do have uh, an additional question. What you, you mentioned, you you brainstormed and looked at some of the other things. I mean, this has been a hot topic for for quite a while. What what are some of those things, and has it uh, gone? Uh, uh, we we've we know that uh, we know what Nevada does. We know what Arizona does. Have we looked at doing something like that? Has it been in you know in Arizona? You, there's no there's no point making. You you, you draw. You, you you've got one time and then you lose it. Um, we, we've got, consistently, we've got people, as Austin said, they're, they're drawing, they're turning it back in, they're drawing, they're turning it back in. Uh, have we looked at other things a little more drastic? Again, I know that most of these things are a social, these are all social issues. Yes. But have we looked at, at doing something like that? And, and if so, what was the consensus? So we have, um, we have a, a t I have a team that we have a weekly discussion of these kind of things, if not maybe every other week of trying to look at new ideas. Um, we have several on the board, but we're waiting for the end of this year's um, permit cycle when everyone's starting their permits to come up with final decisions because we don't, we wanna make sure that we're analyzing the correct data. Um, and I'm hoping, hoping to bring something back out in the next year to address some of these issues again. Um, so I don't have the exact answer of what we're talking about, but it, it may be making the surrender rule more stern, um, doctor statements more stern. So and that, that kind of stuff, but I don't have exactly what we're doing yet. So stay tuned. You guys can't get rid of me. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? 
Thank you, Lindy. Appreciate it. Questions from the public. I, I don't think you're done yet, no, though. <laughs> Questions from the public. And just a reminder, the public mic will be this one in the center. That's the presenter mic on the side. Uh, questions from the public. Uh, my name is Jason Aiken. Um, I've got a question on just the the 60-40 um, and just kind of more of a clarification for myself. What's the what's the the, the main intent is just to get more high point holders through the system, but we're not in increasing what's actually going to be drawn out the door. So I don't know how uh, uh, how that's going to, uh, let's see, Chuck talked about it gets to the pyramid. How long before it's going to get to that pyramid, I guess, is where I'm questioning. Where Where is that going to come down to where, okay, it's no longer going to make a difference in point creep? Any any idea? I I don't. Um, we we're looking at it, and you know that this will take a big effect on the higher permit units, like the Wasatch, the Manti, um, and it may hit that plateau. Um, we don't know exactly how long because people do switch around. This isn't a, a set where you only comply for one unit rest of your whole hunting career. So it's a hard question to answer, but. It, 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 it may plateau like you, you bring up, but it also will get people, those max point holders are, are plateaued through the draw and, you know, a little bit sooner than they would have if we didn't do the 60-40. Um, my question is on the any bull tags. Is there a cap on the number of out-of-state tags? And is that something you've looked at? Um, currently, no, there is not. It's a combined quota. Okay. Um, it's not something that we're wanting to have entertained because right now we only issue about 5% oh. of those permits to non-residents. So currently we usually do a 90-10. And so we okay. All right. haven't had that issue. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions from the public? Okay, we have two comment cards on this one. Uh, Kevin Norman. Well, you can't read it, but I he think he's Norman. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Newman, he thought Norman. You tell us who's right. Braden's right. Kevin Norman representing SFW tonight. Thank you for your time. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, as SFW, are opposed to the 60 40 split we'd like to see it kept at where it's at the 50 50 um the main reason amongst our fulfillment committee was um just looking out for the youth and the new hunters it, it uh really stifles their chance of drawing so that's the main reason there um as far as the um any of the elk permits going to draw um we uh, support that um decision um reluctantly um on the stern note that it's a one year trial period and that it's brought back through next year and uh, uh, to see what happens. So thank you for your time. The next one um, doesn't want to public comment or comment oh. publicly, but this uh, Keith Adams, um, he's does not support the over-the-counter elk permits um, feels like that that we know the demand from the from the over-the-counter process, and 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 here's one that would blow things up. He would support going back to going over-the-counter for deer permits to take pressure off of elk permits. So, yeah. All right, we'll open it up to comments from the rack. Always got to be one. I know, there's always one. Go ahead. If you could state your name. Uh, I'm, my name is Jason Aiken. I've got to, to, I'm going to comment on both. Uh, so the, the over-the-counter elk um, going to the draw, I mean, I understand um, when we've got a limit limited number of tags um it, it really it does come down to what kevin said it's just not fair uh for people that 
can't have access to a computer when sales are going through the uh, through in, in eight to ten hours. So um, I, I'm, I'm not against the draw system. I think I think the draw system works very well um, when you have. Uh, a supply and uh, that doesn't meet the demand um, and so it does it makes it more fair for everybody that wants to play the game um, but uh, to go back to last year I I think that uh, unlimited over-the-counter elk tags is probably the better route to go um, just because I I think that it's the one last the one last permit that we can get over the over the counter and and uh, have the a true opportunity hunt type of a deal. So uh, my second comment is on the 60, 40 split. Um, uh, she, uh, Lindy talked about, uh, you know, if we, if we square points, when we go into the bonus uh, system, it takes away opportunity for people with young uh, people with less points, um, uh, primarily the youth um, technically moving 60, 40 to the high point holders is we're doing the same thing. So I don't, I don't understand why one is okay, but one isn't. Um, I, I, I personally think that uh, there's, or we do have two different systems right now. We have a preference point system for the general season when the uh, supply and demand is a little bit more in line um, and, and, a, and a preference point system works really well for that type of a system because you've only got to wait a couple of years. Um, sometimes it is six, um, but uh, those people have the opportunity to go hunt other units that do only take one or two years. Um, they choose to wait that six years. That's, that's their choice. Um, when it comes to uh, our, over the, our, our uh, limited entry and, and once in a lifetime, our, we've got it's spread across the board. Um, there are some units that you can draw high points, um, Pontagon archery elk. Um, you can draw with, you know, within a couple, a uh, couple years I've had, I've, I've had friends draw that, that hunt, um, just on their five-year waiting period while they're putting in for deer or while they're waiting their, their five-year period for deer. Um, but then we've got the, uh, limited entry for the Henry's, um, that one to become a high point holder is, is, never going to happen for my daughter that I just started putting in for a couple of years ago. Um, same thing with all of your once in a lifetime. Um, uh, it'll take, it, it'll take 150 years for somebody to start applying now to ever become a high point holder. Um, in, in, I mean, even if they just, we don't put any more people even in the system just right now, it'll take somebody with zero points this year to draw. 150 years to be a high point holder. Um, so I, I personally think that there needs to be kind of a line drawn in the sand um, between and splitting up uh, limited entry units and saying, okay, Colorado has a, a unique rule on how they allocate uh, non-resident permits. And maybe Austin may, may be able to correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's uh, if, if it takes more than so many points for a resident to draw, they only allocate 10% of the tags um, to the non-residents. But if it takes less than that number of points, then 20% of the tags are allocated to non-residents. Why couldn't we look at something like that? When your supply and demand is so far out of whack, it just makes more sense to have more, more permits available in the bonus point draw than it does the high point, because that's where more, most of your people are is in the bonus point draw and it makes it goes back to more fair for everybody because we've set we've set this expectation that once we become a high point holder we'll we'll, we'll be guaranteed a tag well 150 years for a sheep tag that's not very many people are going to make that so i don't know uh, thinking outside of the box coming up with things like that um might be a way to look at it, but uh, no, I, I I don't think the 60-40 split's the right way to go. In any, in, and I really think that it would actually be better if we went the other way. Um, we're not moving any more people through the system. Um, it's just a matter of, instead of taking them off the top, we're making it fair, more fair for everybody um, and, and saying, hey, this is just the way it's gotta be because we can't guarantee everybody a tag. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Do you have a comment there, Lindy? Let me clarify something. Yeah, go Can ahead. Can I clarify something real quick? Yep. So Austin asked a question about how many unique hunters. So they just replied back, 
I knew they were listening. <laughs> Um, so in the last two years, we had 25,300 unique ID numbers in the last two years. And then 31,200 in the last three years for any bowl. Yes. Does that help? Yep. Thanks, Lindy. Let's go to comments from the rack and uh, go back to what Jean said. Let's tackle the 60-40 split first, and then we'll tackle the over-counter Health permits second. So let's discuss the 60 40 split, try to get a motion on that one, and then jump over to the elk. So, comments from the rack. And, and maybe if I could start. Uh, you can. I can't? You can. Oh, I can. Thank you, Riley, for giving me permission. Um, Are you passing the chair? For a moment. Yes, please. <laughs> I, I would just like to add my comments here. I apply all over the Western U.S. in hunts, um, and I'm at the stage in my life where my kids are a key. I got home very early this morning from Colorado uh, where my kids are hunting. I, I have a tag, but I really don't care. I haven't even carried a gun a couple of the days because uh, my kids are why I go hunting, and I apply all over the Western states. I love Utah's system. I, I would be very hesitant to change our 50-50 split. We use the word fair a lot. I hate the word fair. I think it's the other F word. <laughs> but I, I, uh, wow. it, it's a horrible word. It's a horrible thing to, to, to work on. Yeah, so I, I think with the 50-50 split, you get the best of both worlds. I really do. I feel like everybody has that name in the hat and those that have sat around and earned it, so to speak, get a uh, an increase their odds. So that's my that's my two cents. I love where we're at with the 50-50. I would hate to mess with that. I don't want to do Nevada. I don't want to do, so Nevada is all random. Colorado is guaranteed max. Let's please not go either of those directions. That's my comment. I'll make a comment. <clears throat> First, I want to commend and thank Lindy for coming up with a suggestion, coming up with something like this. She's in an impossible job. You know, we've put the division in an impossible situation. There's too many hunters and there's not enough resources. I mean, I, I ran her numbers on the 60-40 split, say, okay, if I have 20 points for Moose right now, how long before I make it into the max? And we're giving about 60 moose tags a year to the max draw. So it's only going to take me 34 and a half years, right, to get to that. So I'll have 55 bonus points. If you go to a 60-40 split, you might give a couple more moose tags and shave off a couple of years. It's not a fix. And so I think the division, the board, somebody needs to start a draw committee, a long-term, what are we going to do committee so that we can start looking at this. We need to support the division and give them ideas. And yes, the RAC process is great, but there's other avenues and we need other minds in here thinking about what Utah is going to do long-term because this is not a fix. I'm opposed to the 60-40 for what we've talked about. Um, I think there's other things that can be done, but for now, let's preserve it the way it is. Lindy already interpreted the rule differently last year, and when we were always favoring the 50% random, we now favor the 50% max. For example, when there's nine permits, it used to be split, right? And so we'd give four to bonus and five to random. Now we give five to max and four to random. We've already made that adjustment in how we read our 50% rule. So taking it to 60 is too far, in my opinion. So those are my comments. Thanks, Austin. Riley, go ahead. So I'd also like to commend Lindy. She she gets to travel all over the state and get beat up over stuff like this, and it's not it's not a fun thing. Uh, too often times we 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 look at the division as as an enemy to the sportsman or to the public at large because of some of these social issues that we face. I'm a very opinionated individual. I also uh, agree with both Braden and Austin. I don't like the 60-40, not necessarily because it's a bad idea. It's just not a long-term uh, a, a plan for us. I would like to see something much more drastic to, to help alleviate with point creep. 
Um, one of the issues, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a business guy, and you can cut costs in business, and you can do those things which are good, but you have to increase revenue. We have to have more animals. It's, it's, it's not necessarily just about point creep. We, there, I know that we're always looking to do more things, but we, we may have to do some things that are much more drastic to increase the amount uh, of the supply that we do have have in order to fix some of these issues and that, that we're going to have to think outside the box and get a lot more creative in that in the meantime to 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 approach uh, as as some of austin's numbers i mean he, he's a numbers guy that's what he does for a living i i know where i'm sitting in my once in a lifetime and i'm not guaranteed a desert sheep tag for another 34 years because i'm not in in that I'm 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 going to be older than Gene by that time. No offense, Gene, but I, I'm not even going to be able to get out and hunt sheep be, because of that. So we, we're going to have to do some things that are a little bit more drastic and maybe a little less popular in in order for us to to achieve what we want. So what what's the long term goal? Because it's not about 2022. It's not even about 2023. It's going to be about 2030. And in those again, the the, the future of of the hunting in the state, we all have, we're, we're, we're losing hunters right now because of those opportunities aren't there. And, and they're not ever going to be there if, if we don't take some really, really drastic measures right now. Additional comments? Go ahead. Uh, I would be interested to know uh, if we really are losing hunters because you look at our population growth, and that's why we're having the problems we're having with the point creep and with the, the elk now and the deer th 25 years ago is because we got more people. I mean, you look at how many people and how many people we're projected to have. Our percentage may be going down of people hunting, but I don't think our number of hunters is going down. Other comments? Okay, entertain a motion on the max points. 60-40 split. All right, Chair, <clears throat> I'll make the motion that we re reject, let me see, that we reject the recommendation to go to a 60-40 split and leave it at 50-50. Okay, we have a motion to reject the 60-40 split, leave it at 50-50, do we have a second? Riley will second that. Any additional discussion on the motion? All right, let's vote. All in favor? Chad? Yes. And that's unanimous. We don't need to ask for opposed, so thank you. Let's talk about the over-the-counter elk permit recommendations. I won't make a comment on this one. I think this one's going to be an interesting one. Well, I won't make a motion. I won't make a comment to start, Tammy. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, I have opinions here, but we'll see where it goes. Well, this is going to be easy. Let's go ahead and get a motion then. Oh, okay. I knew we'd have something. We'll get it rolling. I'm just Tammy. hoping my kids aren't watching. Uh, I, I have to say, I have, are we asking questions or this is comments? It's comments, but questions. occasionally we allow questions. If you have a good one, well, Tammy. No, I was going to make a comment and then I thought, well, wait No, it's comments. Okay. Yes. Um, we've enjoyed the three season hunt. We've had a lot of fun as a family, um, but I don't agree with it. And uh, I, I do think that. In my opinion, I would prefer that they chose a season and and went with it that way. But that's just me, myself, and I just don't tell my kids. Thanks, Tammy. Go ahead. Uh, I agree with Tammy on that. That, uh, but uh, I also uh, think that, like I met, talked about here just a minute ago, uh, when you, we, I think the only fair way to go is, is to draw. I not. I like being able to buy it over the counter and have done for 
40s, near, however long the Alpha Tech's been over the counter. I've had had one, but uh, uh, I think the time's come. I remember the mess we had in, in the mid 90s with the deer tag before they went to a draw, and and I, I feel for people, particularly on the open bull tag, that don't, don't have time to sit and buy their computer or whatever, or stand in line at a licensed place to buy a, a tag. The, the, I think they're being handicapped, and so I I, I support the division going to a draw, and I don't think it'll ever go back. Literally, I, I think we're to the point that it's gonna need to be a, a draw too. Thank you. Go ahead, Jim. Um, these uh, agriculture people down here know that uh, the most permanent thing there is is a temporary fence repair. And the uh, most permanent thing there is is a temporary draw or a trial hunt. We've had the trial hunt and that, they become permanent in a year or two. And uh, that's the way it, it's been with the, the division. Uh, the most permanent th thing there is, is what, whatever they bring up is te temporary. And uh, the public, I think that that had a lot to do with uh, the sentiment that we got in uh, uh, in the farm stack uh, that we got back. Uh, they they know that uh, once it go, goes there, it's gone. Now, I think probably that uh, it's going to end up there anyway pretty soon. But... Uh, the the public sen sentiment and of course when we talk about public sentiment the people that are opposed are the ones that are going to make statements going to going to put uh, have an input and the, the ones that aren't opposed aren't going to say much and so probably the public sentiment isn't quite as much as what it appears but for me uh most of the public sentiment has gone that way, and uh, I'm going to have to support them and uh, go against the draw. Thanks, Gene. Chuck, go ahead. Yeah, uh, one of the comments that came up a couple times was that what if we took, put um, the multi season in a draw and left the rest over the counter? And I, I wondered, I I can think I would support that, but I can't remember how many how many tags do we have in the multi season? Sorry, I had a comment before. Now I have a question and a comment. All You're messed good. Up. So right now, when the multi season is just off the seventeen thousand five hundred, but this year we had seven thousand four hundred thirty permits purchased for multi season any bull. Um, so. Okay. So, Lenny, just to clarify, the multi, there's not a cap on no. the number. We will sell as many multi-seasons as we get requests all, for until they're, until they're all gone. All 17,500 could be multi-season permits. So I, I feel like we need to clarify this. Yeah. So, so the clarification is that, okay, archery permits don't count against any quota. They're unlimited. And so the, the, the thought is that multi-season definitely tempts archers, right? And if they jump from archery to multi-season, which happens, um, I, uh, I'm an example of that. I hunted archery and I switched to multi-season because why not? Um, we saw that the first year we sold the multi-season permits. So uh, 2000, Lindy, give me the year, 2018. What year did we switch, Lindy? Was it 2017 that we switched? No, yep, it was 2018 we yeah. switched. So in 2018, we introduced the multi-season permit. And let's remember, the reason the multi-season permit came to be is because we had a lot of requests for a program similar to Dedicated Hunter and Elk. So it was a, a strong public sentiment. We want this, we wanna see this. Um, we didn't need another Dedicated Hunter program as an agency. Um, so we said, let's offer it in a different way. When we did that, we saw Archery sales go from 12,231 down to 9,700. So they did drop. 
you know, a little over over 2,000 permits. And I, you can assume that a lot of those switched to multi-season. That said, this year, 2021, we are back to selling 12,400 archery permits alone. And so, although the idea, I understand the idea or the cinema or the philosophy, philosophy it's just that it, it, it won't solve this problem. It won't, getting rid of the multi-season permit won't force a bunch of folks back to archery. There are other hunters, either, either any weapon or muzzleloader hunters that have started to buy that permit. And so it got us to where we are more quickly, introducing that permit. I want to acknowledge that. I don't want to hide that. It got us here faster. And if we reversed it today, it wouldn't fix it. So putting that in a draw wouldn't fix this without significantly increasing the number of permits. I got a question, but you think because the any bulls sell out so quick that they're not there. That's why the archery tags came back up. Possibly. I mean, it's got, what you're saying is, is it, is it a consolation prize yeah. for some folks? I'm sure it is. Yeah. Um, and, and if you separated it, if you separated it back out though, you still have that many people that want to hunt archery now because the multi-season, they're not counting double or triple against the quarter. They're only counting one for one. And so moving it back just won't fix it. Other comments? Go ahead, Austin. Um, <clears throat> I understand, you know, there's a sentiment to let's keep it how the way it is. Um, we want to hold on to our heritage of having an over-the-counter hunt in Utah. That's what a lot of the comments were that came in. And I think there's there's something to be said for that. Utah is a heritage-rich state, and we should try to do what we can to preserve what we have. But at the same time, as we look forward, you know, I look at examples of a lot of other states that have tried similar things. Like Idaho is a great example. They wanted to keep with their general over-the-counter so they could use that term. When what they've created is these mini draw days where it's a waiting room in a system that is horrible when compared to ours in Utah. And I've already got alarms set in my phone right now. The first day is December 1st. It's coming up soon where you have to get on, you get stuck in a waiting room, you've got 30, 40 windows open on your screen plus multiple devices, and you're all trying to beat this draw that's not fair, really. I mean, we can look at it and say that isn't fair. Um, what about the guy that doesn't know how to use the computer? What about the guy that only has one phone and doesn't know what a second tab is? You know, that's not fair to that guy. And and so I, I think saying that we need to make this more equally beneficial and make it fair, as fair as we can, is is right. And that's probably going to a draw unless we can change the supply. So we need to all realize that it's probably headed there. Right, we're, there's gonna come a time when we're not gonna be able to hunt multiple species in a year, and our kids aren't gonna be able to hunt every year. And that's just how it is, unless we can grow some more animals and the division can find some more under a rock, like that's just how it's gonna be. So I think the easiest route for me to look at this and say, what should we do is let's change the supply. Let's change it to unlimited. We've already talked about 25, 30,000 people that are interested in any bull. Let's put them out there on the landscape and see how the crowding is. And then let the elk committee decide what to do with multi-season, with what to do on quotas, caps, division of units, whatever may come next. But for now, let's change the supply, let them have it over the counter and make it unlimited any bull tags for this year alone is the one year trial of we'll make it a draw for one year. I agree, that's that's never gonna be a thing. So a guy who doesn't draw this year, then you say, oh, it's a draw next year, surprise, but you don't have a preference point. So now you're not gonna draw again. There's gonna be some mad people in here if we let them have a draw two years in a row. So I say we change the supply and petition the board to go unlimited this year. That's my comment. Go ahead, Tammy. I think we just discovered the reason why our system crashed. 
<laughs> Maybe what we should be discussing is only one IP, P, or whatever we call that address can be on line at a time. <laughs> I was going to say, Tammy, you can't fix that one. Um, I, I want to make a comment on this one, and I won't be voting because we have an odd number on our rack today. So even if it's split, I wouldn't. There's not a split, but I still want to make a comment on this. I, I think the idea we got a lot of public feedback that they want to maintain this history and this family hunt of an over-the-counter hunt, and I, I understand that sentiment. I. I can definitely appreciate that. The reality is as soon as these tags started selling out in under a day, it is no longer an over-the-counter hunt. If a guy's tied up or something happens or he doesn't have access to a computer, it is not an over-the-counter hunt for that guy. Um, when there were three or four days, they could find a window to get on. Then it was an over-the-counter. Then it was first come, first serve. And, and that had a lot it worked, but as soon as it's under 12 hours, which it currently is, and if we quote unquote fix our system, it's going to even speed it up more. So it's not an over the counter hunt. I think that's a misnomer. Uh, then my other comments would be the L committee meets next year. So there's a couple of reasons for this proposal, as I understand it, primarily is to uh, solve that one day backlog and move people through. But also, we need some data of how many people are on the field. Uh, I asked a question earlier, what's the, what's the division's opposition to that? They don't have a biological opposition. It is a one-year trial. I would strongly uh, suggest or encourage to go to an over-the-counter period this year, unlimited, both general season and spike. I think we might be very surprised to see how few of tags we sell when we do that. I think there's a real fear that we're just going to blow out the tags. I think we'll be shocked to find out that we, it's not going to be devastating. And it's one year. The Elk Committee meets next year. We aren't going to have a biological impact in one year. So that's, those are my thoughts on it. And, and I think, I guess one more thought. I think that kind of, in my opinion, that's the, the compromise. You know, we've had a large percentage ask us not to go to a draw. If we go over the counter, we aren't going to the draw. It is one year. We can still get our data that we need. It fixes the backlog. And uh, again, we're revisiting this next year. It's presented as a one-year trial. So can I ask a quick question? So what we're counting in over the counter is still only online, or can you actually go into the... Uh, offices or anywhere else like in the olden days to buy a tag yes um, you can buy them online at any division office or any agent across the state go ahead austin i'll make one more comment to yours braden and to clarify uh the unlimited any bull i think i'm fine with but you said unlimited spike as well which as far as i understand biologically well, and personally, don't kill my baby limited entry bulls. So the division's probably not going to want more than 15,000 spike tags because they've already decided that in the plan, and they're still selling out in five, six days. So that's still over the counter by your definition. Would that be I, how you wanted it? Or? I hear what you're saying. I still would want to do unlimited both because I'd want to see who actually bought these. I can't make a motion. So you don't have to listen to my thoughts, but that, yeah, me, I would like to do unlimited both. And I really do think you would be surprised if you made them unlimited. I don't think you'd sell as many as we're afraid we'd sell. Okay. I think I, I understand that. I, I think this is going to be a, a revenue hit for the division for sure by going unlimited. Cause there's guys that won't buy it until they're at Walmart headed out of town on the hunt. And, but, the same could go for spikes, and I don't know if we could ask Kobe to answer that, if he's how he feels about it, but I know he's passionate about his baby limited entry bulls. <laughs> well, that wasn't a biased question. So, uh, no, I, I, I think uh, Austin's right. The, the, the fact is, is that spike elk hunting, is, it's great. It's what we get to do because we have extreme quality and limited entry in the state, and I feel like... Um, issuing more permits there would be a bigger discussion because it's it, it's it's different, right? We manage those units for both. We've agreed to 15,000 and that would that would be 
something that I, I couldn't support. So. Well, that may have answered it for me. I'm not going to go against if you couldn't support it. <laughs> Thanks. So, Brent. again, I won't be making a motion, but if I were to make a motion, that wouldn't be my motion. <laughs> So let me just clarify, Austin, you're, when you say unlimited um, any bowl tags, we're still saying we're going to make them pick. They can't, they can't buy a, an unlimited any bowl and then go buy a spike tag. They have to pick one, right? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. <clears throat> by a statute, they can only hold one elk tag in a year, no matter if, it's, if they drew a limited entry or an any bowl or a spike. So they got to pick. Once they buy one, they're stuck with that one. Well, they can buy more than one elk tag in a year. One but, antler, uh, one antler, one antler, antler yeah. sorry. All right, I think we're ready to entertain a motion. So I'll make the motion that we deny the recommendation to take over the counter elk to a draw and make it unlimited any bull tags for 2022. Is that coming right in? I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion by Austin, a second by Chuck to deny taking the any bull tags to a draw and keep them and make them over the counter unlimited in 2022. Correct? Okay. Additional discussion? All right, let's. Oh, go ahead, Vernon. So that leaves the spike out. Does that. We need another motion on the spike then, or what? Well, I would, we could have another motion if we want to change things on the spike, but after this motion, uh, typically if there's nothing else we want to add, we would pass the remainder as presented is how that would work. So the spike would just go as presented. And that would be a draw. Yeah. Would just be the sort of Yeah, not that, sorry. Okay, Lindy, could you tell us what will work on the spike? How will the spike work in 2022 per year so recommendation? If right now my recommendation is to put it into the draw. So, um, so you, yeah, the, the, your wording would need to be deny the recommendation for both, but make any bull unlimited. So then that would mean that we would sell any bull and spike over the counter. In no, his. At, at 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 the fifteen thousand. Yes, at the fifteen thousand, mm -hmm. spike would stay at yes. fifteen thousand, but the yes. goal would be unlimited. Do you want to clarify? So are you motion? ready for a really complicated motion? Is that what you like? So we deny Lindy's recommendation to take over the counter general season elk to a draw, and we also <clears throat> set an unlimited quota of over the counter any bull general season permits and leave the spike bull permits at 15,000 over the counter available as well. Chuck, are you good with that clarification? Yeah, that's what that's what I was thinking in my head. We were on the okay. same way. I think we were on the same train there. Let me clarify you. Okay. So we're going to he's going to read the Okay, so Denise and Alyssa, make sure we've got similar wording here. Um, so the motion is to deny the recommendation to go to a draw for any bull and spike tags and instead go unlimited over the counter for 2022 for any bull, but leave the spike bull permits at 15,000 and sell them and also sell them over the counter. Is that similar to the way, does that sound like what, what you guys have? Okay. I think that's straightforward. I think we're good there. Did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to comment on that. I, I think it's going to be interesting because I think uh, you'll take pressure off of the spike bull um, if you sell over the counter uh, any bull. I think that, that is putting pressure on that. I, that's something I'd be interested to, to watch. Any further discussion on that motion? Gene? Uh, I like the motion except for uh, the unlimited. Uh, 
for the same reason that uh, I didn't like the, the draw, that once you make it unlimited, uh, it probably won't ever go back. Any other, any further discussion? Okay, let's vote. All in favor? Chad? No. And opposed. So we have three opposed and eight in favor. Motion passes. All right. Uh, we're to agenda item eight. Should we take a short 10 minute break? Does anyone need a break? Yeah. Okay, let's take 10 minutes. Let's take five minutes. That always ends up being 10 minutes. <laughs>
All right, I think we're ready to get going. Okay, we're on agenda item number eight, big game hunting season and key dates. Uh, let's go ahead and start with questions from, oh, actually, let's get the public comment, um, online public comment, and then we'll go to questions from the rack. This is on which one? The big game hunting season and key dates. Um, 18 total comments, about 33% either somewhat agree or, or strongly agree. The biggest percentage at 39% is in the neither agree nor disagree, which leaves about 27% that either disagree or strongly disagree on this one. Kevin, I was just trying to bring up from memory, but I don't recall any real comments on that one of why they disagreed. Do you have any anything there? I don't remember, but I'll go. There wasn't really a theme, was there? Okay, I, yeah, I don't think there was really a theme of why they disagreed with this one, so. All right, questions from the rack. Just because it was Kobe. <laughs> Kobe presented, we must disagree. <laughs> There's some truth to that. And, and before questions, I just want to take a second and thank Lindy. She has made this rack tour really, really enjoyable. So <laughs> appreciate it, Lindy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll open up to the rack. Do you, any questions on the hunting season and key dates? Go ahead, Austin. I got a question. I know it's early, but can you tell us how the September archery hunts and the hams hunts, which are now over, do we have any idea how those went? Satisfaction, is it way too early? I, I, the only thing I have is the few individuals that I've talked to. Um, there were some some folks that drew those tags, gave me phone calls, asked me, you know, areas or uh, on the anthro specifically. Um, I know that half of them harvested, but I don't know what the overall, I haven't seen any any of the harvest data. Um, you know, the, the other, you know, November 15th, and they got 30 days on the hams, so I, Austin, I really don't know, um, but I will call you the second that data is available. <laughs> he knows I will. Thanks, Kobe. No, I, I already have my scraper on the website, so as soon as it's populated, I'll know. <laughs> Another question, and this is the best place I could put it because you're the presenter. Trail cameras, technology, while hunting, where did that go and where does it come up again so that the public knows yeah yeah let's get that out there um so that will be in the december rack january board so a couple of weeks and i'll be back down here to discuss the division's recommendation on those issues thanks one more question keep going kobe do you have any heartburn about it was brought up that the youth any bull and this is so confusing, this terminology for me, but because we have youth general season any bull permits, and then we have youth general rifle any bull permits, which are two totally different things, even though I said the same thing. One's in the draw and one's over the counter. But do you have any heartburn on the draw hunt that's rifle in September being extended two days to butt up against the Wednesday muzzleloader opener? Not at all. If that's something the rack would like to do and give give the youth uh, more time alone, like that's something we could support. Uh, and, and the reason the be reason behind that is because last year there was a there was a push from the public to extend the archery hunt on these any bull seasons. And so now there's some overlap there, which means there's five days where the youth are hunting while general season any bull archers are also hunting. The terminology really is tough. So um, Right now, there's five-day overlap. This would give them a few more days alone in the field, and there's no heartburn with extending that. Go ahead, Tammy. So I probably heard more comments on that 
you know, off the side about that overlap than anything else. And people do not like that, the youth, that, like the parents and whatever. So is that an option to cut that archery season back so there, so you don't have the, the overlap? Uh, Tammy, it's always an option. This is a meeting where we do it. Um, when we pass that with the board, what we agreed to is we would leave it for two years, understanding that in 2022, we would we would sit down with the committee, rewrite the elk plan, and see if uh, we could see if that was something we wanted to continue. And just just for background, in 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 Utah, the proposal was that archers really don't get any of the prime rut. You know, they don't get it on limited entry hunts. They don't get it, and they came through this process and said, "Look, we're not we're not going to ask for this on on unlimited entry. We understand, but give us a little bit of this." on the general season units. And, and that's where it came from. There obviously is some conflict and I understand frustration there. Additional questions from the rack. Okay, questions from the public. All right, comments from the public. I only have one comment card. Uh, so we'll start there, Jason. Go ahead, Kevin. I was just reminding Jason to get his turned in this time. <laughs> it's Kevin Newman from SFW. I mean, Norman, sorry. Um, <laughs> representing SFW, we uh, would like to support Kobe's um, recommendations. On a personal note, I would, it went through the central rag. They voted to extend the youth hunt to the two days to where it butts up to the muzzleloader hunt. Um, I'm always looking out for the kids and I'd love to see that happen here as well. Thanks. See, I called it. Yeah. Glad you're keeping an eye on me, Brad. Um, I'm Jason Aiken. Uh, I, I, we hunt the Zion unit um, for general season deer. Uh, we had a, I mean, everybody kind of had a tough year. Um, several years ago, we used to have a five day rifle hunt uh, on, on some of these Southern Utah, uh, units. Um, and, uh, a lot of people that I've talked to, uh, really feel like we should try and go back to that. Um, and so, uh, I mean, uh, that's, if that's something that we could try, uh, and, and do again, um, we would like to see something like that put into place where that, uh, regular rifle hunt gets, gets, uh, five days instead of the, is it nine now? So thank you. Thanks, Jason. Okay, we'll uh, go to comments from the rack. I would have to support that idea, Jason. Um, I think I think that uh, for the most part, I've heard very few positive things about the deer herd and uh, the lack of the deer herd, I should say, and. I've, I've taught my kids. I was pretty proud of my granddaughter this year. Uh, she was very successful in the mentored hunt with the antelope. Uh, they found, they got into the general bull season and my son that would never let anybody else take the first shot, let her take the first shot. And she got a five point, point general bull tag at 12 years old. So when we got into the deer hunt and we couldn't find anything more than a little three, four point, she's passing on all of that. And and her mom and her dad are both, you really should get your first deer under your belt, you know, and you get three. And she's like, no, grandma says, let the little ones live. So I was proud of that. And I think we need to get back to the, at, at some point in time, we all got to figure out how to get that deer, deer herd back on their feet. And I would support a five day hunt. I would support shutting the deer hunt down for a couple of years, let them get back one way or another. I, I just think we gotta give them some help somewhere. Thanks, Tammy. Other comments? Go ahead. Uh, uh, the comments I had on that were, uh, uh, well, there were some that wanted to shut it down, but I don't think that's really feasible. But I, I think there's a lot of people that would like to see until we get 
better moisture and conditions for the deer to come back, and that's what it's going to take for them to really come back. That we need to go to a five-day hunt. Any other comments? I could see it just chomping over there, Riley. I was. I could tell you just wanted to address that. I, I, uh, Kobe, sorry, not right. It's Kobe. I, I've been called way worse, Braden. So, <laughs> but you could have called me a lot better. <laughs> no. So, no, I, I think that one of the things that the board actually asked us to look into this, they said, listen, we want to do something besides just cutting permits. Is there anything else we can do? Um, and they said, we want you to look back through the data at five day hunts and we wanna know what impact they have. And I'm gonna summarize that impact and then Kent Hersey's online and we could ask him to present some of the data. But we went back through and, and the things that we saw from five day hunts, it, it coincided with a rebound in deer populations. So when we cut to five days, we saw deer populations swing up um, and buck doe ratios increase. And we also saw that on units where we had nine day hunts. Um, it did not, have any impact on harvest. In fact, those who were more selective probably were less selective on a five day hunt, right? If you would have passed the small one on a nine day hunt, uh, those individuals may have, may have taken that buck. And there's nothing wrong with harvesting a young buck. I wanna state that publicly too. But, but if, if, if they would have passed, they may have been less selective. Hunters felt more crowded. Um, and, and so hunter satisfaction also went down. So, Really, the take home message was it didn't impact harvest. Uh, harvest rates were the same and it didn't, um, it just caused hunter crowding. If, if the results were different, I would probably be the first one supporting it, standing up here and saying that this is something we should do because this is a way to still provide opportunity. Um, Colorado went even more drastic, it's been, uh, quite a while ago, but they went down to a three-day hunt. Um, all the way back down to a three-day hunt, they actually showed no impact on, on harvest success rates or anything like that. Um, so it, it won't impact harvest. Now, and if, and, and Tammy mentioned this, and we hear this all the time, why doesn't the division, why don't they close a hunt? And, and we do, and we would, if we were at the, uh, any kind of lower biological male threshold. When, when we're hunting buck deer, we're hunting males. And it's the, the Disneyfication of America says that there's one male and one female, and, and they have a family, right? And they raise little baby deers together, and, and that's not the way that it works. And, and even as I look at Tammy and Verland here, if I, if I came to you and said, you don't have enough bulls, and you need to run, one bull for every cow, you'd look at me and tell me to go home, right? You'd say, that is not gonna help my herd grow, right? You run the minimum number of bulls you need on the landscape to make sure that every cow is serviced and, and that leads to the most productive herd. Deer the same way. Deer populations are struggling in this, on this, especially on the southern end of the state, right? We know that. And we haven't hit a biological threshold of where every doe doesn't have the chance to be, to, to be pregnant, right? And so we're not negatively impacting any populations through hunting. Um, and we've adjusted permits to make sure that we're meeting the buck doe ratios that we've agreed to in the plan. So I hope that provides some context as to why we bring the recommendations we bring. We do care. Um, we are doing things to help mule deer populations. We've had aggressive predator control. We've done uh, more habitat work than any state in the West. We have installed guzzlers everywhere we can expand habitat and we'll continue to do this. Um, but the idea that closing the hunt will help herds is, is it's not accurate. It's like running a hundred bulls for hundred cows. Okay, I'm gonna comment. <laughs> Cause now I mentioned. Uh, so I don't think that that's anybody's proposal to do one bull or one buck per female. Um, I do have to say, being in this business for a really long time, 
both hunting and running cattle, uh, there's a huge difference in forage, in pressure, in whatever else. So like when we're running cattle, we call it running cattle. We don't literally run cattle, right? You put them in a pasture, you make sure they got plenty of feed and water, you leave those suckers alone. If you run cattle, they're losing weight, they're feeling the pressure, they're not catching. Um, so I think that the sheer pressure on wildlife in general, but specifically, um, specifically the deer herds, and I, I just say, I, I'm not a biologist, but I've learned this from the ground up, right? The school of hard knocks. Um, wherever there seems to be elk, uh, the deer herds, I, I don't, they just don't seem to be in the same places. Um, same way with the horses, wherever the horses are, they're running everything else off, right? Um, the antelope don't seem to be bothered by the, by the horses. Uh, they can kind of handle the, I don't know maybe just because they run faster, but just being on the ground every day and out here and just observing this kind of stuff, um, it just seems to me like we have way too much pressure. And I don't know if it's the, the hunt seasons are just never ending. I mean, they're just back to back hunt seasons year round. Uh, pressure just in general. I don't care about the harvest end of, the, of that. I just assume not get one, unless it's a wall hanger, and then I'm gonna be the first one pulling the trigger, but um, anyway, that's just my snide remarks. Colby, I have a question, since we're, this has evolved into more discussion. Uh, one thing Tammy said that I, this is a thought that I've had just trying to figure out, you know, what more can you do? Because there's only so much you can do. If, if the division can make rain, that would really help us out. I don't know what kind of conservation tags we need to have to make that happen. But the, the comment that Tammy had of just running the animals, I think there's some real merit to that. Uh, in my in my understanding, Idaho really stacks their hunts on top of each other. We do our very best to hunt, um, stagger them out and have some hunt going on all the time, uh, you know, and and there's just no break for hunters being in the woods. And so whether you're hunting deer, you're hunting elk, you're still spooking the deer. Um, have we looked, do you have any, have we looked at that at all, if we could provide a break there? Now, the, the comment I would have is I think it's just getting more unrealistic as the population in Utah increases, people move to Utah to recreate outdoors. And, you know, I, I could, I'm sure I can speak for everyone in here. When you're out hunting, I'm running into more guys out recreating than I'm even running into other hunters. So I, I don't know that we solve it by stacking up the hunts on top of each other, you know, having the deer and the elk and everything being hunted at one time so they get a break in between. But just kind of curious to hear your thoughts. I, I think that both of those are very fair points. Right. Everything in deer is related to body condition that's related to nutrition and energy expenditure. Right. Um, and and Braden, I, I think I agree with you in that if we were the only predator on the landscape for deer, we may be able to have more of an effect than we think. But, you know, I, we're not the only predator on the landscape, first of all. Right. These animals were born with eyes on the side of their head and flat teeth. They're looking out there. Everything's trying to eat them. Right. And so there are other predators on the landscape that are pushing them around all the time besides just hunters. The other thing is, and you mentioned this as well, Braden, is that um, a, a lot of our, our BLM ground, our forest ground, they're all multiple use. You know, hunting is just one use on that ground and the other uses are becoming more and more active on the landscape. And so we could look at some of this and I'm not saying that it's a bad idea that we shouldn't, and we probably can't have the impact we wanna have just by reducing seasons or timing. It's, it's, it's bigger than this. It's bigger than just, just hunters on the landscape. Kevin, do you have something to add to that? Well, I was just gonna ask Chuck and Dan, do we have, do you have, you know, round numbers on visitation on, the, on our public lands locally? 
I, you know, I don't have that off the top of my head, but we're seeing record numbers of people year round. I mean, we're seeing ATV and UTV traffic, uh, uh, and that's definitely going to be having an effect on your wildlife. We we see a lot more recreation than we've ever seen before, and 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 just just hiring enough people to clean up after them is a hard job. So, and I, I'm sure the BLM is probably in the same boat. Yeah, we're in the same boat too. I've been here for. 15 years, I used to be able to go out in the landscape and hardly see a soul. But now you go out and there's people all over the place and they're really causing a lot of trouble. Um, recreationists from out of state, I think are kind of the primary problem. But like Tammy said, our wildlife are under constant pressure and they really don't get a break. The hunting seasons go on from August to December, January, right? So. They're on the run all the time, and then you get into shed hunting, and shed hunting has become a pretty big problem throughout our field office. We got a lot of people that go out and grid. Shed hunting is fine, I think, but the way that people are doing it, I think, is not all that great for for our resources on the ground, and they're putting the deer under extreme pressure at a very vulnerable time a year or two. I think Nevada has some dates for shed hunting and limitations for shed hunting, and I feel like it's something that Utah ought to look at and try to help out the deer population in particular. Braden, there is there is one more thing too that I, I want to mention. That is that there there's some interesting stuff that happens when you hunt when we watch collar data. The home range of these animals will actually some decrease by quite a bit. So so their their energy energy expenditure under hunting pressure reduces their forage quality probably reduces too, because right they're picking security over movement at that point. So I, I don't know what that means. What I do know is that we don't have any kind of problem with pregnancy rates in does. Now that those animals are healthy enough to have a, a healthy fawn, that's where, you know, they've got to have those fat reserves. Go ahead, June. Um, I went through the uh, 2019 annual report on deer. Uh, I don't understand why we don't have a 2020 annual report on deer yet. So we're going back two years to, to see the latest one. But uh, I was, uh, I wish I had taken a calculator and counted up the number of doe deer that uh, were taken uh, on that annual report because I'm sure that it's like five does to every public uh, tag that is issued for does. And a bunch of them fall under uh, fee mitigation and free mitigation. And uh, as I said, I wanted to, I'm, I'm kind of stuck on this land, landowner thing uh, that, for instance, uh, are landowner tags ever reduced when the public tags are reduced? And are we giving out too many uh, doe permits uh, into this uh, mitigation thing. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what mitigation is about. Let me take a shot at that, Colby. Um, Gene, we do issue um, depredation permits to landowners, but we're very restrictive on the season dates when we do that. We're tar trying to target resident animals. So if we have animals on a field in the valley in July or August, they're not migrating up on the mountain. They're largely not available for hunters anyway. And all they're doing is causing damage, right? They're causing a problem for the, for the landowner. They're not available to hunters because they're, because they're on private land year round. Those are the animals we will continue to provide opportunities to remove those animals. 
because they're not they're not a resource that's available to our hunting public and they're a detriment to our to our, our, our farming community. We, that those are the animals that we try very hard to target with those with those depredation tags that we get out. We try we 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 try very hard once once the deer the migratory deer start to um, come down off the mountain onto the fields. We we try to shut off issuing those depredation tags and limit those season dates so that we're specifically not to target the deer that are available to the public during the hunting season. So that's it's a balance. But, but we try hard to do that. We are issuing doe tags, but it's to try to target resident deer that are living on, on, on um, farming land year round. Hopefully that helps. It helps a little, uh, but uh, th two things I'd like to see is that uh, that information is out for the public can view that they know how many deer are, are going where, that every, every tag issued is accounted for. And uh, the other thing is um, that uh, every opportunity to, to make the, these uh, things available to the, the public is, uh, is taken up because uh, I think think that uh, sometimes the, the public are, are getting the short end of this deal. Gene, those are both good points. Like we wanna make sure that the data is available and accessible. We work hard to do that and we're, we're continuing to work to provide better data. We're working right now on a big game database with the public interface that should be ready in a couple years that will hopefully do a better job at that. And couldn't agree more. When an animal can be taken by a public hunter, it's always more beneficial for us to do that. And, and we strive to do that and we'll continue to do so. Thanks, Gene. I appreciate the comments. Uh, you know, and, and I do really feel strongly that we have these meetings to discuss issues. We wanna hear from the public and we wanna beat it up. Uh, we don't want to just run down the agenda items. So I appreciate it, even if we're taking a little bit longer. Any additional comments or, or uh, I guess any comments from the RAC on agenda item number eight, big game hunting dates and key dates. Okay, I'd entertain a motion. <clears throat> I'll make a motion that we accept the 2022 big game season date recommendations with the exception of extending the youth general any bull season to end on September 27th, just two days. Thanks, we have a motion, do we have a second? I'll second it. You know, if you typed with all 10 fingers, can I? I am typing with all 10 fingers. <laughs> but extend the youth any bull draw, draw hunts Two days. Two days ending on what day, Austin? It would end on September 27th. Alyssa and Denise, did you, guys, did you get that or would you like me to read it back to you? Chad, Chad seconded. Um, so this is what I accept the 2022 season dates, but extend the youth any bowl draw hunts two days ending on September 27th. Is that, is that accurate, Austin? Okay. All right, any additional discussion on the motion? Correct, yeah, it, it, very little impact that way. Yeah, good question. Okay, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor? Chad? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. All right, final 
Agenda item, CWMU landowner in 2022 permit recommendations. So we'll start with uh, the public input, online input, Kevin. We gotta find it. Okay, we had 10 total comments on this agenda item. 50% of those 10 neither agreed or disagreed. That one always baffles me. 20% um, strongly agreed, 20% strongly disagreed, and 10% somewhat disagreed. Good, we got some great direction. Great direction. All right, questions from the rack. Man, that paper you flipped over was like small print all the way filled out. I thought you were really going to hammer us, Austin. Two questions. Chad, on the uh, contiguous question, from how I understand it, CWMU has to have contiguous acres, and that's sometimes why public land or whatever, you got to get all the landowners around you to join up to get enough acreage. It all has to touch. Is that accurate? Yeah, for your initial application, it's not, it excludes public land. Okay. So, so yeah, they need to have a minimum of 5,000 for deer pronghorn and 10,000 for elk or moose. So one question I have that, and, and I'm sure there's an answer for this, but when I look at the Pavant enzyme, why does it have the lower piece and then 3,000 acres up on the mountain that's not contiguous? Yeah, so, so we have a few of those statewide that, that don't touch. So that base that they have meets that contiguous. And then because it's other land that's really close, we've allowed a variance for that to happen. So any, any time that it goes outside of that, then there's a variance. But because they have that base, um, there's, there's a probably five or six, at least five or six of those statewide. Follow-up question on, um, I appreciate the presentation where you showed some maps of CWMUs that included private land or public land, sorry, so that we could see. Now, one thing I did not understand because I'm not familiar with it is you talked about traded land where this CWMU traded some public land that they included for some private land that's now open to the world for trespass. But how does a hunter, a sportsman, know that that trade land is open? Is it marked differently? Does it have to be marked or because that's not going to show up in my onyx properly. It's going to show up as private land. So how do I know that he's traded that to me? And it is on our hunt planner. Um, so there's there's maps on our hunt planner that you can go in and click a, a layer that will show all the trade lands. That's currently where it is. Other questions? Go ahead, Gene. Now, I'm not clear on what uh, what does the division get out of uh, a permit that goes to the CWMU. What? So, so we get they do buy that permit. It's it's a voucher that's given to them. So, so we do get the voucher fee. Is that what you're asking? The probably what we get more than anything is landowner tolerance for the wildlife and an incentive for them to to have wildlife on their land where. A lot of these places, there was, there wasn't that tolerance. They wanted the wildlife off of their land. If I'm an out-of-state hunter and uh, deal with the CWMU uh, and uh, get a, a slot there, do I pay a state uh, elk license? You pay a non-resident fee uh, of buying that permit. And that, that's what the division gets out of it. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to, to get that clear in my mind because it's, uh, it's kind of hard to figure out how the division's getting anything for the uh, So So, Gene, in addition to, like, to the tolerance, we also get public access to the private land. So those are the, you know, tolerance, public access, those are the two main trade-offs that the public gets um, back from the CWMU. 
Go ahead, Barb. When you have a new CWMU, do you typically see a reduction in depredation permits? So is that the trade-off? That can be in a lot of, yeah, in a lot of scenarios. Uh, that's one of the reasons why this, uh, the CWMU program was formed is a lot of depredation issues. Um, and this is more probably Northern Utah, but I mean, you have, you have drainages is that all we dealt with was depredation. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of unit four specifically, uh, and I think the last two years combined, we've had $3,000 worth of depredation payments there. Um, so yeah, drastically reduces our, our workload there um, and the complaints from those individuals. Any additional questions? Yeah, let me ask a quick question. And I think I know the answer, but um, on your depredation tags, aren't the majority of those irrigated farmland? Yeah, yep. So there's normally quite a big difference between what qualifies as a CWMU and irrigated farmland, right? Yeah, a lot, a lot of times CWMUs are a lot of rangeland. Um, a lot of times too, they, they kind of have both. They'll have some of that. A little bit of both. Agriculture land in okay. it too, yeah. So it can be both. Any other questions? Questions from the public? Okay, we don't have any comment cards from the... Jason? Oh, this is Kevin. <laughs> if there are any other comments, get a card up here again. We don't want you to feel like you didn't get your chance. So go ahead and stay up, Kevin. All right, Kevin Norman representing myself. Um, I've been kicking this hornet's nest for years on public land inclusion in CWMUs. Um, I hunt up in the Ogden unit in Northern Utah. There's very little public ground up there. It's mostly compiled of private and CWMUs. Um, but what's irritating is when there's a nice canyon, nice chunk of public ground that's included in these CWMUs. Um, the terms used enforceable boundaries for years. Um, obviously now with Onyx and these different platforms, um, it's it's pretty easy to navigate where you're at. In fact, if you don't have the right layers on, somebody could actually think they're on public ground hunting and they could be on a CWMU. Um, so it's a complex issue. I know it is, it can't totally be solved tonight. Um, but I would ask that you, you know, to start the ball of rolling and um, getting looking at all these um, through whether it's the committee, how it's handled, I'm not sure because it's gonna it's gonna take some time to navigate through each individual CWMU. But I just hate to see our public ground when there's limited access be swallowed up in in CWMUs. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. The other common card uh, didn't want to address but I may have a question for you. This is phrased like a question, but it's on a comment. So if you want to clarify, but the comment is, would it be possible to make more CWMU tags public to help move point holders through the system? So I think if it's a comment, it, we would like more public tags to move more people through the system. Is that fair? Okay. Thank you. Okay, comments from the rack. Go ahead, Dan. I remember seeing that as a question from one of the commenters. Can we address that question? Is that a possibility? Just going back to the question scenario of it, using tags issuing to the public to push those match point holders through quicker, is that doable? Yeah, you know, periodically we open up rules and we, we look at the rules. So I, I think it can be a discussion point for sure when that, when the CWMU rule gets opened back up. Thanks. Other comments from the RAC? Go ahead, Tammy. I do have to say kudos to those that uh, jumped through the hoops to have a CWMU. Um, I haven't quite got brave enough to do that, but I, I know that there are definitely some hoops and I really appreciate the division acknowledging private property uh, 
and and the the historic value and current value of what it does for wildlife. I've said that I've said that for years. Um, uh, it wouldn't wildlife would not be where it is in Utah if it was not for private property and for uh, BLM and Forest Service permittees that continually improve their land, continually uh, do the maintenance on on water uh, sources statewide or on private and it's a big deal it really is it's it's uh it's not a hardship on us and it is just a sense of responsibility i have to say uh not only do we love our livestock and our lifestyle but we love the wildlife as well and i think the cwmu is a great program so kudos to them thanks tammy Go ahead, Austin. I'll just make a comment <clears throat> about the private land. I think it's only going to work if we find the public land that's, you know, encapsulated in a CWMU boundary and and basically create a stink or call that out. And that usually only comes from those that care about that area where they're hunting. And so I think the public needs to hear if, if you have a CWMU that's around you that you want to look at the map on it's real easy to jump on the hunt planner turn on the layers and let's figure it out um, i think the division's open to looking at it chad's done a great job presenting it better and showing us the maps as we've asked them to do um, but we need to do that because if if you don't hunt around a cwmu especially us in southern utah you're not as familiar with it and you might not care but if you're from northern utah or you hunt up north a lot it is a big deal and we need you to look at it and we need you to bring it up to the division, to the racks, and let's let's fix it. So that's my comment. Go ahead, Tammy. I, I do have to say, I really did appreciate the maps. They were great. And I like that transfer, you know, the public for the uh, private lands. And, and I do have to appreciate that part because I don't have Onyx. So it does make more sense to me. Any additional comments? If not, we'd entertain a motion. I don't want Austin to make all the motions, so <laughs> I can see him over there ducking his head. So I'll make a motion that we accept uh, uh, the proposals outlined in the by, by Chad, by the Division of Wildlife. How do, how do you want me to say that? Except as presented. Except Seems as presented. The most okay. It's shortest and concise. Okay. That's my motion. Yeah. Too. Said it was perfect, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Riley. And Tammy seconds the motion. Any additional discussion? Okay. All in favor? Dan, Hi. you still with us? Thank you. Chad. Oh, sorry, Chad. Well, I'm doing good. <laughs> Name's done. Thanks, Chad. Hey, I, I got home pretty late last night. <laughs> uh, thank you. That passed unanimously. And that's the end of the agenda items for tonight. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks for the public input online. We really appreciate that. Our next meeting is December 7th at 6 p.m. In, in Richfield. So. At our DM, there's a DNR building in Richmond, where we always, where we were last time, yeah, when they're by the airport. Okay. Meeting adjourned. I just want to hit the gavel. You mean adjourned? Adjourned. Adjourned.